Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our ninth lecture. Uh, this lecture is on magnetism and it's the last in the series of lectures on electricity and uh, magnetism. And it's a uh, combined lecture for both the calc and the non-calc students. But the calc students will have some extra and uh, that'll be in a uh, another uh, video after this one. Okay, but that's only for the uh, calc based uh, physics students. Uh, the lecture that you're going to watch was again uh, recorded last year and I had to replace that introduction with this one because uh, the, the, the old introduction was not uh, appropriate for your class. Okay. If you remember magnetism, when we first started off uh, studying electricity and magnetism, um, I said that uh, there doesn't seem to be a relationship between electricity and magnetism. Okay, and uh, that was indeed the case until until the 1800s. And the reason was is because there is no force between north and south pole, and north and south pole that's for magnetism, and positive and negative is for charge. Uh, there is no force between uh, positive and negatives and north and south poles. Okay, and that is if the charges are static, and by static that means they're not moving. Okay, so if you were to take a um, a bar magnet here and you put it on a, a swivel okay basically that's like a compass and you put a positive charge nearby uh, it's and you can even move the uh, move it slowly move the positive charge slowly around this it, it won't attract or repel the, the north or the south and same thing with the negative okay so it appears that the two are different but they're not um, it, it took uh, 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 Alessandro Volta to invent the battery before we could discover what the relationship was between electricity and magnetism and the reason was is that the battery uh, is able to uh, sustain a um, uh, is able to create a sustained current okay and you need a current in order to create a magnetic field all right and so there's the there's the relationship it's not static charges that uh, interact with uh, magnets it's currents that interact with magnets and we'll see that as the uh, the video goes on okay so um, this was actually discovered by uh, Orsted and uh, Orsted it was just in the middle of a lecture he was just giving a lecture to uh, some students in the early 1800s in 1820 and uh, he had uh, a compass and he had a, a, a wire and he put the uh, uh, current across the wire using the battery and it deflected the uh, the compass needle and he goes oh that's interesting and he did it a few times and that was it that was the discovery. Uh, Orsted discovered it but it turned out that uh, another uh, physicist uh, called Ampere was the guy who actually came up with the law that governs what the relationship is okay and so um, We'll start off uh, with uh, Ampere's law. So um, I can't give you a full expression of Ampere's law. It uh, not only requires calculus, but it requires uh, vector calculus, which is beyond the scope of even uh, Physics 102. Uh, but you know, I can give you a very good idea uh, of uh, like what's involved in uh, Ampere's law. I can give you some intuition, and uh, also I'll give you the formulas for Ampere's law applied to two situations. One is a straight wire and the other one is a coiled wire which is known as a solenoid. Okay and solenoids actually turn out to be very important uh, for uh, magnetism. All right so let's start off with a straight wire and so what we see what we're seeing here is actually uh, uh, it's the same straight wire but they're two different views. Magnetism has a lot of things which are, are, have to be drawn in three dimensions okay and so uh, you're going to see um, a lot of my diagrams will actually have a couple of uh, a couple of views to try to get across what I'm trying to say there. So uh, in this um, uh, diagram where I have the side view here you can imagine a wire and it's just a straight wire here like that and we're going to attach the bottom of the wire to the positive end of a battery and the, uh, uh, the top of the wire to a negative end of a battery and uh, what happens is, is as the current flows you can see the current there I as the current flows from positive to negative it establishes a magnetic field and it's kind of surprising the magnetic field is actually uh, uh, not parallel to the wire but it circulates around the wire okay and so to show you that circulation uh, I'm giving you here a top view so this is actually the same wire but now you see that uh, that little circle with a dot in the middle that's the wire coming straight at you okay so it's coming straight out of the uh, the paper there okay and the current's coming out towards you and uh, as a result it actually establishes this magnetic field which circulates around the wire like that magnetic fields are called B fields I don't know what the history of that is but they're called B fields and you can definitely 
definitely see that there's a B field there because if you take a compass, you'll see that the compass, the north and south of the compass, will align itself with the B field. And so I've shown the compass over on this side, north and south being aligned with the, the, the circulation of the B field this way. But if you move the compass to the other side, it'll turn. And if you had the compass over here, it would be that way. And if you put the compass over there, it would be that way, okay, along with the, the field lines. And uh, actually in one of the labs uh, on magnetism, uh, if you take a compass and you uh, you would have taken a compass and you would have moved it around the wire and you would have actually seen that the B field is uh, circulating. Okay. Uh, before I give you the formula for this, um, I have to tell you about the, the direction in which the circulation occurs. And uh, because magnetic fields, they're chiral fields, they, they're kind of like they have a, a right handedness to them. Uh, there's this uh, right hand rule and it's actually applied in many different places. Okay. And there are different variations of the right hand rule. And the way the right hand rule works in this particular situation is you take your right hand and you point your thumb in the direction of the current. So you can see here, here's the current over here. The current is going up, so I'm going to point my thumb up. Okay, and you'll notice that my fingers curl around my uh, my thumb, and they point in the direction in which the magnetic field is going to circulate. Okay, it takes a little bit of uh, uh, thinking about it, but you know, just point your thumb in the direction of the current, see it's, my thumb is pointing up, and my fingers, they're going to point in the direction of the circulation. So if the wire is going up like this, the B field circulates like this, okay, towards you and then away from you and then towards you and so on, okay. So it takes a little bit, but um, there's the right hand rule and it describes the, um, the circulation of the uh, magnetic field around the wire. Um, what about an equation though? Okay, so uh, is there an equation that actually describes this? Well, um, you know, I, I'm not going to give you that the vector calculus form of, um, of Ampere's law, but it basically says something like this. It says, look, if you uh, uh, go around the wire and you just add up the B field as you walk around the wire, the, uh, the sum of that B field multiplied by every little step that you take along the way, Okay, uh, if you add up that B field uh, multiply by every little step, that's equal to the current going through the, the middle of the of the um, uh, going through the wire. Okay, so um, uh, applying Ampere's law to uh, a straight wire, here's the B field, here's the entire path as you walk around the wire. Okay, like that, and that's going to equal the current being carried by the wire like that. Okay. And then there's also this other constant mu naught uh, and mu naught is called the permeability of a free space. Okay. So um, again, Ampere's law is you add up the B field as you walk around a wire. Okay. Multiply by every little step. Now, if you're walking around the wire at some radius R, then you're etching out a circle of radius R and the circumference of a circle of radius R is going to be two pi R. So here's the B field. Here is the total distance that you walk around it and that's got to equal the current going through the wire okay multiplied by this constant known as the permeability of free space okay if you rewrite this it looks like that and this is how we will use the equation okay so this is the b field generated by a straight wire and it's equal to mu naught the permeability of free space i'll give you that value in a second uh, multiplied by i which is the current uh, and uh, divided by 2 pi r okay so uh, as you go further and further out from the wire, your R is going to increase, your magnetic field will decrease. Okay. Uh, if you have a bigger current traveling through the wire, well, then you're going to get a bigger B field. Okay. So uh, bigger I, bigger B, the further you are from the wire, the smaller B makes sense. Okay. Um, what is this permeability of free space? Um, it, it's kind of the equivalent of epsilon naught. So if you remember when we were uh, looking at uh, capacitors and I said you could build a capacitor by using two parallel plates, two parallel metal plates, okay? And you got an equation there. And in that equation, you had this epsilon naught. And that was called the, uh, the permittivity of free space, okay? And the permittivity of free space was kind of like a measure of how much empty space, what we call in physics the vacuum, it's how much empty space could sustain an electric field, okay? So electric fields can travel through matter, 
all right but they can also travel through empty space so you know empty space isn't without properties and uh, one of the properties of empty space is how much electric field can be sustained in that empty space and that is what this epsilon naught measures well guess what mu naught is it's the equivalent of that but for magnetic fields it's a measure of the ability of the vacuum or em empty space to sustain a b field okay and it has a value and here is the value, okay? So like all of these constants, uh, no one remembers them on a test. I would obviously uh, give them to you like I did on the last test. And it's equal to 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6 Tesla meters per amp. Okay, so there's a new unit there, this unit Tesla, all right? And um, uh, you'll act, when we do the Lorentz law, uh, you'll actually see and what a Tesla is a lot better than right now. But basically a Tesla is a measure of a magnetic field. So the unit, the MKS units of uh, magnetic fields is a Tesla, okay? Meter, you know what that is. And an amp, you know what that is. And so an amp, it's the measure of current. And that's like uh, if you have so many Coulombs uh, traveling per second, that's uh, your, your amperage, okay? Or how much current is being traveled, is being, um, is moving, okay? So, um, so uh, this unit Tesla, uh, like I said, I'll give you a better intuition into how big a Tesla is, uh, what how it uh, relates to other things later. But right now, a Tesla, all you need to know is that it's a very big unit. Okay, uh, typical Tesla, uh, typical um, magnetic. Um, measurements of magnetic fields in the lab are usually down in the milli tesla range or even down into the micro tesla range okay and of course the earth has a magnetic field so the earth's magnetic field is down in the to the uh, micro tesla range and it's between like 25 and 65 micro teslas depending on where you are uh, on the earth okay so um there you go uh, there's uh, uh the wire uh, the magnetic field due to a wire. So we can do our first problem. It's pretty simple if you uh, just plug into the equation. So how strong is the magnetic field? One centimeter from a wire carrying a 100 milliamp current, okay? So 100 milliamps is pretty easy to create in the lab, okay? And uh, so we have this wire, and we're just gonna put one milliamp of, uh, sorry, 100 milliamps of uh, current through it. And uh, we're gonna measure the magnetic field about one centimeter from the wire, okay? And by the way, the instrument to do that is called a Gauss meter, and you should see that in the, in the lab. All right, so uh, R is basically one centimeter, or we have to work in MKS units, so it's 0 0.01 meters and the current is 100 milliamps but we got to convert that to amps because we got to work in the MKS units for current and that's amps not milliamps so 100 milliamps is 0.1 amps all right and we just plug that into the equation above so um, there's that mu naught multiplied by the current uh, divided by 2 times pi so there's 2 times pi and uh, there's r and it works out to be uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 6 teslas 10 to the minus 6, that's micro, so it's 2 micro teslas. So that's pretty small. It's actually smaller than the um, Earth's magnetic field, okay? And so you would barely be able to deflect uh, a compass with this, all right? So um, you really, to get uh, any kind of like uh, deflection of the compass in the lab, you're going to have to do things up, up into the uh, several amp range, okay? And when you're putting uh, uh, like a couple of amps through a wire, um, it gets a little dangerous because the, the wire can heat up uh, pretty quickly, okay? And uh, it can actually, you know, wires are usually made out of copper, but they can get up hot, it can get hot enough that uh, it'll actually uh, melt the copper and cause sparking and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, you know, like if you're talking like moderate uh, uh, occurrence, uh, like 100 milliamps, and you're only measuring at one centimeter's distance, you're not getting a lot, okay? I'll show you how to make more powerful magnetic fields uh, in a little bit. Okay, so uh, there's the uh, uh, there's the magnetic field due to a wire. Okay, but I told you that there was another shape and that we were going to study, and uh, that's basically a, a coil of wire, okay? And so we can also apply Ampere's law to this coil of wire. Again, the, the mathematics is uh, very complicated. I'll, I won't go through how it's uh, how Ampere's law actually gives you the magnetic, the formula that we'll use, but, you know, if you, it, you know it's, it's doable. Uh, and um, so what you're seeing here in this picture 
is basically a coil of wire. Now it's hard to draw a coil of wire in uh, three dimensions. So what you're looking at here is uh, here's the positive end that's attached to the positive end of a battery. That's a, this other side is attached to the negative end of a battery. And what we, what we have here is a coil of wire. And you can see here, the par this part here, when it's going down, that's towards you. That's close to you. That's like the front of the coil. And then it goes towards the back. I know it doesn't necessarily look like that, but I tried to indicate that. You see how there's a little break in that wire? It's not that the wire is broken. It's that it's going behind the other wire. So I'm trying to give you a sense that uh, this is the front and this is the back of a coil uh, of a, one of the loops in the coil. And so here we go again. Okay, so down here, there's the front and the current is going down in the front and it's going up along the back and then down in the front and back and like that. Okay, so this coil of wire like that is called a solenoid. All right, and uh, they're very important in uh, mathematics. And uh, there's a right hand rule for this too, but this right hand rule is slightly different than the previous right hand rule. It turns out that the two are equivalent, but for a solenoid, it actually makes more sense to have your fingers point in the direction of the current. Okay, so you can see your fingers are going to curl around like that and then your thumb will point in the direction of the magnetic field. So in this particular case, what you have is, uh, you know, uh, orienting my, my hand like the diagram there, you have the current going this way, it's coming down towards me and so the magnetic field would be um, uh, to, to my right. Now if I'm if I turn my hand around so that you see it that way, here's the the current coming down in the front there like that, and you can see my finger is going to point in the direction of the B field. Okay, so again, this is a slightly different variation of the uh, right hand rule. In this case, for the solenoid, you point your fingers in the fingers of the right hand, you point them in the direction of the current, and your thumb will point in the direction of the B field. Okay, and so you could see here that you'll actually generate this B field. So you, I, I only drew one vector for the B field going right through the middle of the solenoid like this. And if you were to put a magnet here, you would see that the south side of the magnet would be attracted to, to this, and the north side would be attracted uh, the other way. Okay, uh, so that's the way a magnet actually orients orients itself. Uh, um, in a B field. The north is on the side where the arrow is pointing, okay, and the south is on the other side, okay. If you were to put the magnet on the other side, well, then it would, uh, the north would be pointing, you know, still in the same direction, the south would still be pointing in the same direction like that, okay. And so, uh, well, this is a solenoid, okay. And um, the reason solenoids are um, very useful in uh, magnetism is because um, the solenoid is actually um, concentrates the magnetic field inside the, the coil. Okay, it's not that there isn't a magnetic field outside the coil, but what happens is, is outside the coil, the magnetic field kind of flares, and I tried to draw that in this diagram here. Okay, and so you can see that inside you get the B field, and I drew uh, quite a few vectors in there uh, indicating the B field. But when it exits out the the mouth of the uh, of the solenoid, then it kind of flares around, and the B field then circulates around here like that, and then comes back like that and goes through the middle. All right, inside the solenoid, the B field is uniform. Okay, so it's it's not like it's stronger on one end or the other. Okay, only at the mouths does it begin to flare out. So if you're if you're definitely inside the solenoid in here, the B field is some constant value and it's always pointing in the same direction. Okay, so it's uniform in direction and constant in, in magnitude. All right, and uh, that's uh, actually uh, kind of like what we found with the capacitor. So in many ways, the, the solenoid is the, um, the equivalent, the magnetic equivalent of a capacitor. Uh, so you remember with a or a parallel plate capacitor, I should say. So you remember with a capacitor, uh, if we took one metal, uh, plate here. Okay. So uh, this doesn't look like a metal plate because you're looking at it edge on. But you know, if you're here's your metal plate. Okay. It's looking at it edge on. So we've got one metal plate there and that's positive and another metal plate below it and that's negative like that. Okay. And inside the capacitor, the electric field was again uniform direction in the way I drew it there. It's downwards and it was always constant magnitude. Okay. And so um, uh, you know, there's the the magnet, the solenoid, which gives you a uniform, uh, constant magnetic field in the middle, and there is the parallel plate capacitor, which gives you a uniform, uh, constant electric field in the middle. At the edges, uh, the electric field will flare 
for the capacitor and the magnetic field will will flare as well for the uh, solenoid okay uh, but there but this is what makes them very useful because uh, you know like vector calculus is very difficult and uh, so you know if you have a uniform vector field that's very easy to work with okay so there it is now um, that tells you the direction what I the right hand rule but what about the um, the formula well uh, again I can't go through you know the Ampere's law with all the integration and all that I'll just give you the answer and here it is the magnetic field inside the solenoid not on the outside is equal to once again that mu naught this uh, permeability of free space uh, multiplied by n divided by l where n is the number of windings for the solenoid and l is its length OK, and so N over L is kind of like the density of the windings. Like if you have more windings over a shorter uh, length, then you have, you know, I have a higher density here. OK, so this is kind of the density of the windings per unit length. And then, of course, multiplied by the uh, the current. OK, uh, and this makes sense. OK, uh, the more uh, like for every time you make a loop. You know, it's like you're you're doubling. Like if you have one loop, well, then you have so much current. If you have two loops, then you've doubled the current. OK, through those two loops. And if you do it three times, you triple the current. So, of course, the magnetic field is going to go as the number of windings you have, because each time you add a winding, you're adding another loop of current. It also uh, goes as the uh, the current. OK, and it's inversely proportional to the length, because the shorter the length, the more you've concentrated that current into a shorter length and the more magnetic field you get. OK, so those are the three ingredients that go into uh, your magnetic field. Once again, the more windings, the bigger your magnetic field, the, the bigger your current, the bigger the magnetic field. And the more you've compacted it together into a short solenoid, the bigger the magnetic field. OK, so great. And so now we can do a, a, a little problem. Oh, not quite yet. Sorry. Um, uh, um, I told you earlier that we can make really big magnetic fields and uh, the solenoid is how you do it. But you can actually make it even better than just having a coil of wire. You could take this coil of wire and in the middle of the coil of wire, you can add what's known as a ferromagnet, some ferromagnetic material. Okay. And a ferromagnetic material is just any material which is magnetizable. Okay. This is kind of the equivalent for the parallel plate capacitors where you had that dielectric and the dielectric was polarizable and it enhanced the capacitance here you have a ferromagnet and the ferromagnet is magnetizable and it will enhance the uh, magnetic field okay so you still have a solenoid and you can see here that I'm trying to wrap this solenoid this wire around some uh, like um, tube here or not sorry not a tube but a, um, uh, a cylinder and the cylinder uh, is just some ferromagnetic core uh, core. So what are typical ferromagnetic materials? Well, a anything that a magnet will attract, like iron, uh, nickel, zinc. OK, these are all things that are uh, magnetically attracted. Um, examples of things that are not ferromagnets uh, uh, that are actually diamagnetic are things like aluminum. OK, so you wouldn't want to put aluminum in the middle. But, you know, a good, a nice iron core will definitely enhance the um, uh, the magnetic field for a given current and uh, then the equation changes ever so slightly it's still the same so, uh, as above but it's got this extra mu r and that mu r is the enhancement of the permeability okay uh, because of the presence of the um, the ferromagnetic material and uh, this mu r is just called the relative uh, permeability okay and so it's just an enhancement and the number is usually bigger than one I mean you wouldn't want to use a number smaller than one because it would like decrease the magnetic field you use something which enhances the magnetic field okay and so I'm going to show you in the, the next example that we can make quite a quite a strong um, uh, electromagnet uh, using a solenoid uh, wrapped around uh, a ferromagnetic coil okay and so um, the relative uh, so here's my example here uh, the relative uh, permeability of ferrite uh, which is nickel plus zinc, okay, is uh, 2,300. It's a dimensionless number because it just says by what factor is the magnetic field increased. And so by putting this uh, nickel zinc core inside the solenoid, it's actually going to increase the magnetic field by 2,300 times. And uh, so that's pretty good, okay? So uh, we're going to use it as a core in an electromagnet made with a, with a thousand windings of wire over a length of five centimeters okay so our solenoids only like five centimeters long like that and we have a thousand windings of wire 
around there. And you know what? When you make these things, like you don't have to like do uniformly. You could like you could go over them back and forth like this. You know, like you could have uh, several layers uh, of windings. Okay, as long as they're all turning in the same direction, that's fine. Okay, and then we're going to put uh, three amps of current through this wire. Okay, and I want to know how much of a magnetic field does this generate? And uh, it's kind of surprising. Um, so here we go. Uh, uh, I'm just plugging into the um, to this equation right here. Okay, so we're just going to plug into that equation from u r. We're going to plug in 2,300. Uh, from u not, we're going to plug in that value that I gave you earlier for n divided by l. Well, n is the number of windings, which is a thousand. L is going to be um, uh, what I say five uh, centimeters like that, and i is going to be three amps. Okay, so it's a very simple uh, little formula there like that, and we plug in and we get a whopping. 100 and uh, 174 uh, Teslas. Okay, uh, that is um, quite extreme. Okay, uh, you know, like um, um, you you definitely be able to pick things up with this thing. All right, so there you go. Now, what if we didn't have that uh, uh, ferrite in the middle, that ferromagnetic material? Well, if you do this again, but you get rid of that 2,300, well, then you only get 75.6. Uh, milli Teslas. Okay, so uh, in in reality, uh, like if you were doing this, like three amps is really big. Okay, you wouldn't be able to sustain this for a long time. So it's really that that three amps which is making this number very big. But you know, um, you know, if you're down in like maybe a hundred milliamps or, or ten milliamps, you know, that's something which is doable. Uh, you know, that would certainly uh, decrease this number. Okay, so say say it's like uh, instead of uh, three thousand milliamps, which is what three amps is, you you cut this by a factor of 100 to just like uh, uh, 30 uh, milliamps, well, then you would get 1.7 Teslas, which is still a very big uh, field, okay? And that would be very doable in, in the lab. All right, so there you go. This is the uh, this is the story of uh, Amper's Law and uh, how you can get a magnetic field generated, not from static charges, but from moving charges. And another name for moving charges is a current, okay? And so that's why for the longest time, at least until the 1800s, well, until 1820, when when Orsted discovered this, uh, we didn't know that there was a relationship between electricity and magnetism uh, because all we had was static electricity and we had magnets. Okay. In fact, the word for electricity, electron, is uh, the Greek word for amber. And so as way back, uh, as far back as the Greeks, they knew about static electricity because they would just rub amber and amber would, you know, acquire a static charge and then they also knew about magnets because magnets come from a, a, a mountain called magnesia in, in Greece and so they knew about magnets but they didn't you know I don't know if they played with them but they would have noticed that uh, one attracts the other no it took uh, Volta to invent the battery which gave us long lasting currents and then once we had those long lasting currents then you could say oh a current will deflect the, uh, a magnet and da -da, that's how we discovered that uh, currents actually create the magnetic fields and then Ampere's law. Okay so uh, there's the story with um, currents creating magnetic fields but uh, what do magnetic fields do? Okay, uh, so you know that an electric field will cause a charged particle to accelerate, either collateral, collinearly, or, or against uh, the magnetic, or sorry, the electric field, depending on uh, either with or against the electric field, depending on whether the charge is positive or negative. But what do magnetic fields do? Okay, uh, well, implicitly, you know that they deflect magnets, but uh, that kind of uh, just begs the question: What is it about the magnet? that the magnetic field uh, causes an interaction. And uh, that's what this Lorentz force is. Uh, so magnetic fields do exert uh, forces on charges. But once again, magnetic fields don't exert a force on a static charge. Magnetic fields exert a force on moving charges, in other words, currents. OK, so this is kind of interesting. You need a current to create a magnetic field. And then once you have a magnetic field, that magnetic field will exert a force on moving charges not on static charges okay so electric fields do okay once again you know if you have an electric field and say the electric field is up or down and you put a charged particle in it so say the electric field is up you put a, a positive uh, 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 particle in that electric field it'll accelerate up because it accelerates with the electric field uh, if you have a negative charge and you put it in a, an electric field and the electric field is up then the negative charge would 
uh, accelerate in the opposite direction of the electric field. But how do how do magnetic fields work and how do they exert forces on moving charges? And the answer is the Lorentz force. OK, and the Lorentz force, this is this gets a little bit difficult uh, to picture. OK, the Lorentz force is interesting because it's not with or against the magnetic field it's actually perpendicular to it okay and so that's what makes magnetic fields kind of hard this right hand rule appears over and over and over again and so to show you the direction of the Lorentz force before I even give you the equation imagine that you have here a positive charge so here's a positive charge Q but it's not standing still if it were standing still it wouldn't even know that there's a magnetic field there it just would not experience anything now this charge particle is moving with a velocity V like that okay and it's moving with a velocity v and it cuts across these b field lines okay so the magnetic field is going off to the right okay and the charged particle is cutting across them at some angle theta like that all right uh what happens there's a force on the charged particle because the charged particle is moving through the magnetic field it experiences a force what direction is the force and this will surprise you it's actually directly out of the page towards you OK, so the Lorentz force, which is the force that a magnetic field exerts on a charged particle, is actually perpendicular to both the B field and the velocity. So let me say that again. The force that the magnetic field creates, this so-called Lorentz force, OK, the force is going to be perpendicular to both B and V. And you say, well, how could that be? How can you have a force which is perpendicular to both of them? Well, there's only one way, and it's got to be out of the uh, out of the page, either out of the page or into the page. Okay, so there's two possibilities, and the answer is it's out of the page, and that's where this right-hand rule comes in again. So this is yet a third variation of this right-hand rule. Okay, and so the way it works is, well, I guess I need to show it to you in this diagram here the way uh, it works is what you're going to do is you're going to take oh I guess I have no so one second here I have a diagram below yeah I'm sorry here it is here's the diagram below uh, the way this right hand rule works is you take the the velocity vector which in this particular diagram I have coming out towards you okay so you start with the velocity vector and you imagine rotating the velocity vector towards the B field okay so you start with V and just like imagine like it's the hands of a clock it's going to rotate towards B okay so you can see here I have theta but I don't just have theta I have theta with a little arrow on it because I'm rotating from V to B what you do is you take your right hand and you point your fingers in the direction of the rotation okay so V is rotating towards B and your thumb will point in the direction of the force okay so there it is that's uh, uh, um, well there it is for a positive charge okay so once again start from V rotate it towards B point your fingers in the direction of the rotation your thumb will point in the direction of the force if it's a po positive charge that's the direction of the force if it's a negative charge then you've got to do one other thing you've got to change the direction uh, it would be in the opposite direction. Okay, I think I might have gotten it wrong up above. I think I said the force was directly out of the page. Actually, uh, actually, it's into the page here. Okay, so we can practice uh, the right hand rule here. So imagine you have this velocity v here, and you're going to rotate it to b. Now, if you're rotating from v to b in this diagram, you're actually rotating clockwise. So you're going to aim your fingers clockwise like this. See how my fingers are clockwise like this and my thumb would be pointing into the page okay so in this case the the force is actually into the page because it's a positive charge if it were a negative charge then the force would be out of the page okay so out of the three variations of uh, the right hand rule this is by far the, the hardest okay so uh, let me just resummarize because it's kind of hard to get your head around okay uh, B fields exert a force on moving charges okay they exert a force on not on static charges but on moving charges the charge here Q is traveling with a velocity V and it cuts across the B field with some angle theta okay the direction of the force is perpendicular to both V and B okay 
And so it's either into or out of the page here. And the way you determine which of the two it is, you rotate from V to B, point your fingers of the right hand in the direction of the rotation, and your thumb will point in the direction of the force if it's positive. And if it's negative, you have to flip the direction. Okay, now that tells you the direction. What about the actual formula to calculate the magnitude of the velocity? And here it is. Okay, so there's quite a few ingredients here. The bigger the charge, the more force there's going to be. That makes sense. Okay, so you know, more charge, the more uh, 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 electrical substance there is for the electric field to interact with. Okay, so the bigger Q is, the bigger F is. The faster the charged particle is going, the bigger the force is. That also makes sense. In fact, if V were zero, if there were no velocity, then the force is zero. So that's actually, you know, one of the points about uh, how the magnetic field interacts with a charged particle. Uh, if there's no velocity, there's no force. Okay, so the bigger the velocity, the bigger the force. Okay, the bigger the magnetic field, the bigger the force. All right, so all of that makes sense. But then there's also this other piece, the sine theta piece. Okay, and the sine theta says that the force depends on the orientation between V and B. So let's look at our diagram again. Okay. And what you're seeing here is the velocity is up this way and the B field is that way. And there's an angle there. Okay. Looks like around roughly 30 degrees. So actually uh, here you would have sine of 30 degrees, which is a half. All right. Uh, if the velocity were perpendicular to the B field so that the velocity is actually cutting directly across the B field, then theta would be 90 and sine of 90 is 1. That's when you get your maximum force. But what would happen if the velocity were right along the B field, okay, so that both of them are collinear, okay, both V and B point in the same direction or, or, or the opposite direction. You could have B pointing one way and you could have V going 180 degrees the other way. Well, sine of zero or sine of 180 degrees are both zero. You get no force. Okay. So if the velocity, just because a charged particle is moving, doesn't mean the electric field, the, the magnetic field is going to interact with it. If the velocity is actually right along uh, the lines of the B field, there's also no force. It actually has to cut across them. Okay. And so um, scroll down. Oops. I, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, scroll down here. Uh, that's what that sine theta is right there. Okay. So once again, when the uh, charged particle actually cuts directly across the B field at 90 degrees, that's when you get your maximum F. When it's either along it or in the opposite direction, then you're going to get sine of zero, sine of 180, which is zero, and you're not going to get any force. By the way, we saw this earlier in the course with torques. Okay. So this is kind of similar to. Uh, to torques. All right. Uh, all right. Now, um, that's the story of the Lorentz force if you've got a charge particle. But uh, what if you have a wire carrying a current? Okay. And uh, a current, uh, don't forget a current is just a, uh, is a, is moving charge, is either one moving charge or many moving charges. And so we can actually recast uh, uh, the Lorentz force in a slightly different form, which is useful in situations where you have a wire carrying a current. And the way we do that is we start off by looking at the velocity. So the velocity is equal to L divided by delta T, where L is the length of the wire that is actually going to be inside of the B field. Okay. And so suppose it takes a charged particle, uh, a time at delta T to travel that distance L. Okay. So it's got to travel this charged particle and enters the B field inside the wire. And then it exits the B field outside the wire and it travels a distance L inside of the uh, B field. And it takes a time delta T. Well, if you travel a distance L in times delta T, that's a velocity. Okay like that. And so now for our velocity, we can rewrite that as L divided by delta T. So this is the Lorentz formula from above, but I took out V and I wrote it as L delta T. Now let me take this delta T and put it under the Q like this. And now if you have a charge Q traveling through that wire in time delta T, charge per unit time, that's current. Okay. And so here's a completely equivalent way of writing the Lorentz force, but this one is more appropriate for a wire 
inside of a magnetic field, whereas the previous one was more appropriate for a charged particle, like a proton or an electron moving through a magnetic field. Here we're gonna actually going to have a wire traveling through the uh, magnetic field. Okay, And so uh, how does this go? Well, the bigger the current through the wire, the bigger the force. That makes sense. If there's no current, you're not going to get any force. And so it's a linear relationship. The longer the wire inside the magnetic field, and I got a diagram in a second, the longer that wire in the magnetic field, the more uh, force there is because the magnetic field kind of exerts so much force per unit length. And so if you have more length, you'll have more force. So the longer the wire bathed inside the field, so it's not just the length of the wire, but it's the length of the wire that is inside the field. Okay, so the longer that is, the bigger the force. Of course, the bigger the magnetic field is, the bigger the force. And once again, we have that sine theta because the orientation of the wire and the magnetic field is important. Okay, and so um, we're ready to do a, a problem. Okay, so let's do a problem here. Um, let's take the uh, the Earth's magnetic field. So at the Earth's magnetic field at a certain point is uh, 50 micro Teslas, like that. Okay. And a wire carrying a 1.5 amp uh, current cuts across the field at 30 at a 30 degree angle. Okay, so so the the wire and the magnetic field they're not perpendicular; they're actually at 30 degrees to one another. Okay, and I want to know what is the force on the wire per meter length. Okay, per meter length. And then I say repeat this, but assume that the wire is actually parallel to the magnetic field. And uh, this is not a hard experiment to do, actually. Uh, you know, you've got your wire and you can just move it around and you can move it around in different, and put, put it in different orientations in space. And when you've got these different orientations in space, you're going to have a different force per unit length because you're going to cut the magnetic field. The wire is going to cut the magnetic field at different angles. Okay, so the first part is 30 degrees. So how does that work? Well, uh, we're not talking a charged particle. I'll do an example of that uh, in a minute. But we're not talking a charged particle here. Rather, we're talking a wire. So it's more appropriate to use this particular form, F is equal to I L B sine theta. And I asked you to do it per unit per meter. So let's just assume that we have one meter of wire. Okay, so one meter of wire inside of the Earth's magnetic field. So we'll set L equal to one meter. Okay. And so uh, it, it's just as simple as plugging in the numbers. Your current I told you was 1.5 amps. Your length is one meter because we want to look per meter. Okay. The magnetic field I told you was uh, 50 milli. Uh, sorry, uh, 50 micro Teslas. Micro is 10 to the minus 6. So 50 times 10 to the minus 6 Teslas. And you work this out and it turns out to be a really tiny number. Okay, only 37.5 micro newtons or, or 3.75 times 10 to the 5 newtons per meter. So a meter of this wire would barely feel any force on it. Okay. Nonetheless, you know, it's measurable, but it would be very, very uh, tiny. Now at this point, um, uh, we can actually analyze the units and you get a better idea of what a Tesla is than what I gave you above. Okay. So if we do an analysis of um, uh, a unit analysis of a um, uh, the Lorentz force. Here we have force. What's that equal to? It's equal to current times length times your magnetic field. The sine theta that doesn't have any units. Okay. And so we know that the units of force are newtons. We know that the units of current are amps. We know that the length of the wire or the length of, you know, of the wire bath is meters. And so uh, we get a unit for uh, the magnetic field Tesla, which is equal to a Newton per amp meter. And you go, huh, what does this Tesla equals a Newton per amp meter? How should I interpret that unit? And the way you can think about it is that a one Tesla field will produce a one Newton force per meter of wire for one meter of wire carrying one amp. OK, uh, then that's assuming, of course, that you're cutting that the wire is cutting the field at 90 degrees. All right. So let me say that again. If you have a one Tesla field, OK, it will produce one Newton of force for one meter long wire carrying one amp. You have a wire. It's one meter long. It's carrying one amp and it's a one in a one Tesla field. It'll have one Newton of force on it. That gives you another uh, another way of thinking of uh, of what a Tesla is. Okay, so um, 
And by the way, uh, Tesla what, it was named after Nikola Tesla, who was a famous engineer at uh, about 100 years ago. Okay, um, so part B, if you remember part B, I said, well, we're going to have the same situation, but now I want the wire and the field lines to be parallel to one another. But parallel means that theta is equal to zero degrees and sine of zero degrees is zero. And so that means there's no force. OK, so here's my diagrams that I'm trying to show you the two different orientations. When you have the wire perpendicular to the B fields, that's when you'll get your maximum force. But if your wire is actually parallel to the B fields, there's no force, none at all. OK, and that's just the way these uh, B fields work. All right. So uh, we're going to do another problem because that problem was with a, uh, a current. Let's do a problem with uh, actually uh, our charged particle. OK, and uh, just to be kind of realistic, uh, the, the northern lights are actually uh, charged particles. OK, so uh, the aurora bo borealis is uh, due to these charged particles. And what happens is the charged particles get they get trapped in the Earth's uh, magnetic field. And they actually spiral. You'll see that in a second, why they spiral. And they spiral. And actually, because of the shapes of, of the Earth's magnetic field, they spiral. But they also spiral, and they're kind of funneled into our atmosphere. And when these charged particles, which are traveling pretty fast, uh, they're electrons, protons, and you know uh, things like that. You know, when they hit our atmosphere, uh, they ionize our atmosphere, and they cause it to glow. That's what the northern lights are. Okay. So I actually looked up some numbers. Okay. And um, the problem that we'll do in a minute, uh, we'll, we'll um, actually use numbers from the Aurora Borealis, okay? But uh, a minute ago, I said that these uh, charged particles would spiral. And you're wondering, well, why do they spiral? Isn't that kind of like, you know, going in a circle? That's right. Uh, you'll be surprised that when a charged particle enters a magnetic field uh, perpendicular to the field, okay, it actually undergoes uniform circular motion. Right. So that's kind of interesting. It's uh, the, the charged particles. They don't uh, they don't just get deflected by the field. They actually start they go in and they do get deflected by the field. I shouldn't say that, but they don't get deflected just once. They keep getting deflected and they keep getting deflected in such a way that they're always going in a circle. OK, and so um, that's what's happening when these um, uh, charged particles from the solar winds get trapped inside of our magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field, they start to spiral. They start to loop like that. OK, and uh, why? Why do they do that? And so that's what this diagram is trying to show. And uh, again, all of these diagrams are really hard to draw because uh, uh, or, and even hard to picture because everything is in three dimensions. OK, so here I have magnetic field vectors and you say, where are they? Each one of these uh, circles with the little dot is an arrow pointing out towards you. Okay, so imagine that the B field, the magnetic field, is pointing straight out of the page. It's pointing straight out of the page. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to fire a charged particle into it. And just to make it easy, because you know, um, positives will spiral one way, negatives will spiral the other way, let's just do a, um, uh, uh, a positive charged particle. So here's the positive charged particle, it's traveling in the plane of the paper and it enters our magnetic field and the magnetic field is out towards us. OK, now use this right hand rule. It's a little hard, but let's think about it. The V is up and the B field is out towards us. So we want to turn from the V field in the plane out towards you. OK, so we want to turn it this way. OK, so here's the V up and we want to turn it towards you. Think of that kind of a circulation. So point your fingers in the direction of the rotation from V to B and your thumb is going to point that way. So as the, the charged particle enters the B field here and its velocity is up and the B field is towards us, the force is actually going to be towards the right. OK, the force is perpendicular to the velocity as it has to be. It has to be perpendicular to both. Well, what happens if there's a force to the side? This charged particle is trying to move ahead and this force is turning it. And so guess what? It starts to turn. But as, as soon as it starts to turn, suppose it's turned to this point. Well, now the velocity is this way. The velocity is towards the right and the B field is up again. If you curl the velocity to the B field, now you find that the force is down like this. And so the, the force is always perpendicular to the velocity and that makes it turn. The force will always point towards the center 
of uniform circular motion, okay? So um, that's what happens when charged particles enter magnetic fields. They undergo uniform circular motion, okay? And uh, the force is always perpendicular to V. So the acceleration is always perpendicular to V. And whenever you have velocity and uh, the acceleration perpendicular to the velocity, the acceleration is not speeding it up or slowing it down. It's always turning it. It's always turning it. It's always turning it. And that's uniform circular motion, okay, that we studied last semester. All right. So actually, uh, you can calculate a frequency here. You can calculate the frequency at which these charged particles rotate. Like how many times do they make a rotation per second? And that's an interesting frequency because it's called the cyclotron frequency. And, and actually, they generate radio waves. And you can actually hear those radio waves. Or you can't hear them, but you can pick up those radio waves. Okay. And so let's calculate the, the cyclotron frequency that uh, uh, of charged particles in the um, aurora borealis. All right. So that's my next problem. Okay, uh, find the cyclotron frequency and radius of the uniform circular motion that an electron traveling at 800 kilometers per second. That's how fast the solar winds are. They're 800 kilometers per second, which is really fast. Okay, so um, uh, so once again, you know, find the cyclotron frequency and the radius of the uniform circular motion of an electron traveling at 800 kilometers per second when it enters the Earth's uh, magnetic field which is about 50 uh, milliteslas, sorry, microteslas, okay? And so uh, it may seem like, you know, how do I do this? But let's just do it one step at a time. The first thing is, let's find out the Lorentz force, okay? And now we're going to use this uh, form of the Lorentz force, okay? Because this is the one that's more appropriate for uh, charged particles. So we got QVB sine theta, all right? And we're just going to plug in the numbers. Uh, for theta, let's assume, uh, like you don't know uh, at what angle, you know, the solar winds hit our magnetic field. And they hit it all different directions. So a lot of different things can happen. But let's assume for this particular problem that the electron is actually uh, hitting the B field at 90 degrees. Okay. And so um, the, the, the electron enters uh, perpendicularly. And that means that theta is going to equal 90 degrees. And sine of 90 degrees is 1. Okay. So that makes life easier. Uh, so basically the the, um, the sine theta here, uh, we don't have to worry about that. That's just going to equal 1. Uh, what's Q? Well, it's the... Q, the charge of, a, of an electron, and you can look that up. Uh, it's actually negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. You've seen that number before. But we're not going to worry about the sign because the sign is just about the direction. Okay. And I'm not even worried about the direction in this problem. Okay. But uh, basically, to, to determine the direction, you would use the right hand rule, determine the direction of the force, but it's negative, so you flip the direction, okay? Uh, again, we're not worried about the direction here, so I'm not worried about the sign. So the charge of an electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, coulombs. I'm not worrying about the sign there. The velocity is 800 kilometers per second, but we have to work in MKS, so that's 800,000 meters per second, or 8 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. The magnetic field is going to be 50 microteslas, which is 50 times 10 to the minus 6 teslas, or 5 times 10 to the minus 5 teslas. You put that all in there, and again, don't forget the sine of theta here is 1, so don't worry about that. You put that all in there, and you get that the force on the electron due to the magnetic field is 6.4 times 10 to the minus 18 newtons. That's a very tiny force, but electrons are very tiny. Okay, now that's the force. And to use the equations for uniform circular motion, which you may have forgotten from last semester, so you'll see them in a second. But to use those equations, uh, we don't want the centripetal force. We want the centripetal acceleration. And how do you get acceleration from force? Just divide by the mass, okay, Newton's second law, okay? And so uh, this, the Lorentz force is the centripetal acceleration in this case. It is, uh, or the centripetal force, it is the force that keeps this thing on a circle. And so the centripetal Centripetal acceleration is just going to be the Lorentz force divided by m. Uh, we just calculated this number, 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19, divided by the mass of an electron. And the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Okay, I didn't write the units in there, but uh, uh, th these are in MKS. Okay, I, again, I would not expect you to memorize that number. Uh, you, you would get it on a test. Okay, and we did see this number in 
uh, one of my previous videos. All right, so if you work this out, and uh, the way I like to do these, by the way, that's uh, just to show you, uh, is I'll, I'll take like 6.4 and divide it by 9.11, and that gives me 0 0.703 here, and then I'll take the 10 to the minus 18 and divide it by 10 to the minus 31. Well, 10 to the minus 18 divided by 10 to the minus 31 is minus minus 31, which is plus. So this is the exponent here is going to be 31 minus 18, or you get basically working this out 7.03 times 10 to the 12 meters per second squared. Okay. Now think about that. That is 10 to the 12. That's like a trillion meters per second squared. What's the acceleration due to gravity? Only 10. And this is like a trillion meters per second squared. So uh, this tiny electron, because it's very light, it's not experiencing much force, obviously, but it is because it's so light, it's experiencing a tremendous amount of acceleration. And now here we're going to use one of the uh, formulas uh, for uniform circular motion. And if you remember this one, A is equal to V squared over R. So you remember uh, from last semester, like if you're in a car and you're going around a corner, if the corner has a radius R and you're traveling out of velocity V, V squared over R will tell you what your centripetal acceleration is. And that's why when you're going around a corner, you feel like, you know, you're being thrown out from the, from the, um, from the center of the, of the turn. Okay. So, uh, we know the acceleration. Uh, we just calculated that that's that seven times 10 to 12 meters per second squared. Uh, what we want to find though, is the radius. Cause that was one of the questions. One of the questions was the radius and the other one was the cyclotron frequency. So, you know, I'm uh, just rearranging this equation. Uh, if I multiply and divide, uh, multiply by R and divide by a, uh, I get this rearrangement and now V, uh, v is the velocity of the charged particle. If you remember, um, it's that 800 kilometers per second, but converted to MKS. So there's the velocity of the solar winds divided by A, which we just calculated. And uh, doing the same division like I do before, it turns out to be 9.1 times 10 to the minus 2 meters or 9.1 uh, centimeters. Okay, so uh, these charged particles you know they're 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 zipping around very fast but you know they're they're basically going in a loop about around that big okay about you know, nine centimeters in size okay that's kind of cool all right so that's what's happening in the aurora borealis the electrons i should say i shouldn't say charged particles of protons would be um a very different radius because they have a very different mass okay all right so uh that's the radius. You can even call it the cyclotron radius, but we wanted that cyclotron frequency because that's actually something that's measurable. Uh, and here's another equation. Uh, this equation here is the equation for, oh, whoops. Uh, sorry, guys. All right, so this equation here is also an equation for uh, uniform circular motion, but this one relates the uh, velocity the radius and the period of the motion. The period of the motion is the time it takes for one loop. And the frequency is just the reciprocal of the period. Okay, so, uh, you know, when we when we did this, we were more worried about the period. So we only worked with capital T. But uh, once you get capital T, the period, you know, one over capital T is the, the frequency. Okay, so uh, we're going to solve for capital T. And so just rearrange this here. You get that T is equal to 2 pi R over V. Substitute in all the numbers that we have above. And you find that it's 7.14 times 10 to the minus 7 seconds. Okay. That is a very short time. Yeah, the electron is doing a loop, which has a uh, radius of about 9 uh, centimeters or a diameter of about uh, uh, 18 centimeters. Okay. Uh, but it's doing it extremely fast. Okay. So this is like uh, 10 to the minus seven. If I move the decimal over like 0.7, that would be uh, 10 to the minus uh, six. So we're down into the uh, microsecond range. Okay. Now the frequency and this is linear frequency, obviously, is just uh, one over the period. So substituting that in, we find that that's going to equal 1.4 times 10 to the 6 hertz. Okay. And 10 to the 6 is mega. 
and so you so this gives us a frequency of 1.4 times uh, one sorry 1.4 megahertz okay and if you're wondering where is megahertz uh, that's just a little bit uh, that's what actually within the uh, AM range okay so uh, if you were uh, under the northern lights and you're tuning your radio uh, through the AM range, uh, you're going to hear a lot of static. And that static is exactly all that cyclotron frequency from the Aurora Borealis being picked up by your uh, your uh, radio in your car. So the AM range is like from 540 kilohertz to 1,700 kilohertz. But 1,700 kilohertz, that's like 1.7 megahertz. And so 1.4 megahertz, it's right in there. Okay, so there you go. There's the... Uh, uh, the cyclotron frequency for uh, electrons uh, in solar wind being captured by uh, the Earth's magnetic field. All right. So um, there's one tiny mystery before we move on to uh, the next subject in magnetism. And that is um, we know that B fields are created by currents. And we know that B fields exert forces on currents. But uh, what is this north and south then? Okay. In fact, uh, when Orsted first discovered that currents um, uh, create magnetic fields, he discovered it precisely because the magnetic field interacted with a magnet. He didn't know that magnetic fields actually interact with moving charged particles. Okay. Amper actually discovered that later. Okay. Uh, and then Lawrence gave it the, 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 the form that we just studied. All right. But um, what, what is this north and south pole? Like, you know, are they, is this something else? You know, like how does north and south relate to anything I said before? Well, here's the thing. Microscopically, if you take a look inside of ferromagnetic materials, what you find is that there is a bunch of looping electrons. Okay. That these electrons, usually the F orbitals of these electrons, they're making these loops inside of the magnet. So if you have a magnet, it, which is basically something like iron, but it's not just iron where the atoms are all scattered in every direction. This is iron where the atoms are actually all aligned like this. And their alignment means that the electrons, as they circulate inside of them, they're forming the little loops. Okay, they're actually forming something like a little solenoid in there. And so each little loop has its own north and south and it adds to the neighboring north and south and adds to the neighboring north and south. And that's what a magnet is. So there really isn't a north, like north isn't a thing. It isn't a substance, like like charge is a substance. Uh, north is not a substance. It's just one side of a loop of a rotating current. Okay, and south is the other side. All right, and if you remember, I said to you that charged particles can be separated. So if you have like a, a hydrogen atom, hydrogen atom is made out of a proton and an electron. Okay. And it's totally possible. It's called ionization. You just take the electron and you move it way off over there and you take the proton, you may move it way off over there. And now you have the charges separated. The, the negative is way off on one side, the positive is way off on the other side, and the charges are, are separate. But you can't separate magnets, uh, nor, sorry, north and south and magnets. You remember that if I have a north and south magnet and I break it, what I wind up getting is two magnets, both of them with their own north and south. And so you can't separate north and south. And you go, well, why? Why can't you do it? Now we know why. And here's why. Because there's two sides of a loop. And you can't have a loop which just has only one side. You know, every loop is going to have a, a, a one side and then the other side. And if you use the right hand rule, so you can see here what I tried to do was I tried to show this looping. So this is a, this is a current. OK, uh, this is a current making a loop here. And uh, this side here, the, the thicker side, that's supposed to be closer to you. And the thin side there, that's the far side. That's supposed to be uh, uh, farther from you. OK, so you see that this, uh, you know, let me see if I can animate it here. It's kind of like this. All right. And if you point your fingers in the direction of the of the uh, current, your thumb is going to point in the one direction. OK, that's the direction of the B field. That's the north side of the loop. And of course, the other side is the, the south side of the loop. And, uh, you know, like, I mean, it's unimaginable. How can you have a loop which has one side but not another side? I mean, that makes no sense. So that's why north and south always come together, because they're really not uh, substances uh, like, you know, an electrical substance. OK, there's no such thing as a magnetic substance. Uh, all they are is they're just uh, two different sides of uh, the circulating current. 
Okay, so there you go. That's uh, magnets. And so now uh, when you're looking at those magnets, you could say, oh, that magnetic field, it's not so much that it's interacting with the magnet as it is it's interacting with the circulating electrons within the magnet. In other words, it's exerting a Lorentz force on the electrons inside the magnet. And that's what causes the, the, the compass needle to deflect in the, in the presence of a current. Okay, the current in, a, say, a straight wire, generates the magnetic field and the magnetic field then then that's Ampere's law so the current in the straight wire generates a magnetic field that's Ampere's law and then that magnetic field exerts a force on the circulating current inside the magnet and that's the Lorentz force okay and that's what turns the uh, the compass in the presence of a uh, of a uh, current okay that's what Orsted discovered all right next topic in uh, magnetic uh, fields is inductance and magnetic or magnetic flux and inductance. Okay, so um, it, it turns out that um, people wondered, can if currents can create magnetic fields, can we use magnetic fields to create currents? And the answer is yes, but it's not quite as simple as just you know you have a magnetic field and a current is created. It's not magnetic fields that directly create currents. It's changing magnetic fields, which will create a current, okay? And so static magnetic fields, they don't create currents. They, they will exert a force on a current, but they won't create a current, okay? So if you have a wire and it's not attached to a battery or anything like that, you just have a wire and you just bathe this wire in a magnetic field, there's no current in the wire, you just bathe it in the magnetic field. Well, the magnetic field is not going to create a current in that wire, okay? So people wondered, is this possible? But if you take this wire and you put it in this magnetic field and the magnetic field grows or shrinks, then it does induce a current, okay? And uh, this is called inductance, all right? And uh, magnetic flux is part of this idea of uh, inductance, all right? This was actually discovered by Faraday and also at the same time by um, another physicist called Henry, okay? And uh, the way to understand this is uh, you have to picture a loop of wire in a magnetic field, okay? And so, uh, again, one of these diagrams, which is kind of hard to draw, so I've tried to give you, give you a couple of different perspectives here. If you look at the loop of the wire directly on edge, okay, so, you know, like here's my hand and you're looking directly on edge, it just looks like this flat line, okay, so that's what you're looking at here. I tried to give it a little bit of perspective, okay, but this is a loop of wire, but you're looking at it on edge, and so all you see is just kind of like a line there, okay. Now, if, if you turn a little bit like this, you know, here's the loop of wire and you turn a little bit, then you'll see it in perspective, and that's what I'm trying to show there, okay. So, you've got these B field lines like this, and you've got this loop of wire, and the loop of wire makes an angle theta. It's oriented at an angle theta to the B field like that. All right. You can define from these quantities here this thing called a magnetic flux. Okay. And here is the formula for the magnetic flux. It's basically equal to the strength of the B field, the area of the loop. Okay. So the loop, I mean, it's, it's just a wire, but the loop is creating like an area. All right, and so uh, the, the the area of the, that's created by the loop that goes into the magnetic flux also multiplied by the uh, the orientation. Okay, and the idea behind a magnetic flux is kind of like the loop is capturing some of the uh, lines of the magnetic field. Like some of these lines of the magnetic field, they're stuck inside the loop, and some of the lines of the magnetic field are outside of the loop. And so there's a the magnetic flux is kind of a measure of how much the loop encapsulates or captures um, uh, B field lines. Okay, and so you can see here, like I didn't draw other more more magnetic field lines outside of the loop, but you can imagine there are maybe more B field lines up here like that. But the loop is just capturing these four, these four B field lines are captured inside of the loop and that's called the magnetic flux okay it's basically equal again to the strength of the field the area and the uh, sign of the angle that the uh, loop makes with uh, uh, with the magnetic field okay now at this point there's nothing about the uh, uh, the uh, uh, there's nothing about uh, uh, you know, uh, any kind of induced current, okay? Uh, if the B field doesn't change and A doesn't change and theta doesn't change, there's a flux there, 
but there's going to be no current inside the wire. All right. So, um, oh, I, I guess I should just point out this uh, uh, diagram. I kind of uh, alluded to it, but uh, you see here, here's the B field. Uh, here's the uh, B field being captured by that uh, that loop. Uh, when it's perpendicular, that's when you're going to get the most B field lines. When the loop is actually along the line uh, of uh, A, uh, sorry, B, okay, it's right along uh, um, the lines of B, well, then there's no flux uh, captured, okay? And so now, uh, how are we going to be able to induce a current? Okay, and the answer is Faraday's law. If you calculate this flux and this flux doesn't change over time, then there's no current. But if the flux does change over time, the rate at which this flux changes over time, okay, so that's like your delta phi. Phi is the symbol for flux, obviously. So it's the delta phi by delta t. It's how fast the flux is changing. The faster the flux changes, the more potential is induced in that wire okay by the way in this context it's often called an electromotive force okay uh, they you, we tend to sometimes refer to batteries as pro providing a potential and in this case uh, an electromotive force but as far as we're concerned it is a voltage okay and so this is a perfectly legitimate way of uh, writing it all right it's just in case you see it somewhere else referred to as an electromotive force it is a voltage okay so if the flux doesn't change over time then there's no voltage okay but if the flux does change over time the faster the flux changes over the time, the more voltage is actually uh, induced. Okay, so once again, it's not the magnetic, uh, um, a static magnetic field is not going to do anything. Okay, you actually have to have a changing magnetic field uh, giving rise to a changing flux, and it's that changing flux which gives rise to a voltage, and the voltage will then create a current inside the wire. This is known as Faraday's law. You'll notice that there's a negative there and that negative actually has to do with the direction and it's known as Lenz's law. Okay and Lenz's law just says that the direction in which the current is created in the loop because there's going to be this change in flux and the change in flux is going to be um, you know because maybe the magnetic field is changing I'll show you different ways in which the flux can change in a second but let's assume that the magnetic field is changing the induced current in the wire is going to try to oppose the change in the magnetic field and so this is what I'm trying to show here with Lenz's law so here we have a B field and say the original B field was all the way out to the end there like that okay but it's shrinking over time this B field is getting weaker and weaker and weaker and so you can see my little delta B there shows how much that B field has shrunk okay well what happens is is in the coil here or in that loop you're going to induce a current the current is going to be induced so that it would create a delta B in the opposite direction to the shrinking B field. So in other words, the current that's created in the wire tries to oppose, tries to create a B field which opposes the shrinking of the, the B field. Okay, and this is known as Lenz's law. Okay, it's a little bit subtle. It's a little bit subtle, but it does say, you know, what the direction is of the current. You know, as the B field shrinks, uh, is the current going to be induced this way or is the current going to be induced the other way? And the answer is the current is induced such that it opposes the shrinking of the B field. It tries to push the V field back out. You know, by circulating this way, it creates like a delta B this way, which tries to push the B field back out. Okay, not a big deal, but there it is. Okay, so, uh, well, there you go. Uh, this is uh, known as Faraday's law. And uh, let's go back up here to Faraday's law again. Uh, technically speaking, you know, I've been saying the B field change, the B field change, but it's not so much the B field that has to change to create a potential. It's this flux that has to change. And there's three things that go into the flux, calculating the flux. What are they? Well, there's the magnetic field, there's A and there's theta. And so you can change your flux by changing B or you can change your flux by changing A, or you can change your flux by changing theta. Now, how would that work? Well, how would you change B? Let's scroll down here to where I talk about that. Okay, how could you change B? Well, one way you could change B is by just pulling a magnet out of, uh, of a loop. Okay, so you have that loop there, and we've got the magnet inside the loop. So here's the loop, and here's the magnet inside the loop. And if you just pull the magnet out, 
what you've effectively done is you've removed the magnetic field and then of course B is going to change. Okay. So one way to change B is to just pull the magnet out, out of the loop. Okay. Or whatever's causing the B field, usually like a magnet or whatever. Okay. So that's one way uh, to change your flux. Another way to change a flux is you have that A, which is the, the area of the loop. Okay. Like that. And you could just deform the loop. You could have the loop like that, but maybe you could squish it out. And by squishing out the loop, you change A. And then by changing the area that the loop uh, uh, makes, uh, you could also be changing the flux. But the more typical way is to just change theta, because by changing the orientation, you're going to change, you know, theta from 0 to 90 degrees, and that'll change like the sine from 0 to, to 90 degrees. Okay? So um, those are the three different ways in which the flux can change. All right. And typically, like in anything that you're building, like in a, an electric generator, which I'll discuss in a second, it's the theta that uh, changes. And all you do that is by just rotating uh, the loop. OK, by rotating the loop, you'll, you'll actually change your theta. And that's how the flux changes. All right. Uh, one more equation before we start to do some problems. Uh, the previous equation that I gave you was actually the flux for a single loop. And what is a solenoid? A solenoid is n loops. Okay, so you can think of a, a solenoid as not just having you know area A, but having area A for each one of the n loops that are in the uh, the solenoid. And so the flux for a solenoid is magnetic field, but the A here is multiplied by n, where n is the number of windings. Okay, sine theta. Okay, so that's why I put the n and the a together because it's yeah, there's a cross-sectional area to the solenoid, but because each winding contributes its own a to the cross-sectional area, the total cross-sectional area, if you want to think that way, is going to be n times a. Okay, we'll need this equation a little bit later, but that's basically the uh, the flux for a solenoid. Okay, now we're ready to do uh, a problem here. Okay, so uh, uh, there's no reason why the loop of wire has to be a circle. If it is, then, you know, its area would be pi r squared. Okay. Uh, but it can be a square and or actually a rectangle. I said square, but a rectangle. So I have a loop of wire and it's going to be one centimeter on one side by three centimeters on the other side. Okay. And uh, this loop is made to rotate 250 times per second in uh, this uh, 500, in a 500 millitesla field. Okay. And I want to know what is the induced potential. All right. And so um, you have to think about this. You know, we've got uh, two different orientations here. Okay. Where is my picture? Here are the two orientations. Uh, the loop at one instant in time, it's going to be like this. And then the loop at another instant in time is going to be like that. Because you got to think this loop is, uh, you know, here's the loop and it's rotating like that. It's continuously rotating in there. And so, uh, you know, at one point it's going to be at 90 degrees then it's going to be at zero and then it's going to be at 90 again and then it's going to be at zero. And if you think about this, you think about this loop rotating in there going from 90 to zero, 90 to zero. In any one complete rotation, it will go th from zero to 90 degrees or 90 to zero four times. Okay. In other words, it'll go from this orientation to that orientation. And then it'll go from that orientation back to that. And then it'll go from that orientation back to that in one cycle. Okay. So um, over here in our problem, the first thing we're going to note is that it only takes a quarter of a revolution to go from 90 degrees, which is your maximum flux, to zero degrees, which is your minimum flux or vice versa. Okay. So that's only a quarter of a revolution. Okay. So here we are. And, you know, there that's only a quarter. That's a half of a revolution. And if I did more, you know, there's a three quarters and then finally you're back again. So every quarter revolution, you're either going from zero to 90 or 90 to zero. OK, uh, so there we go. Now, in one second, uh, we'll go from um, so in one second, we'll go from zero to maximum or maximum to zero, not 250 times, but four times 250 times. Okay, so think about that a little bit. Uh, basically, you know, you're going from, because uh, every quarter turn, every quarter turn of your loop, uh, you're going from a max to minimum or minimum to a maximum. Okay, so this move from minimum to maximum happens four times for every rotation. There's 250 rotations in uh, per second, and so you're going to have uh, 1,000 times uh, that the uh, you're going from minimum to maximum. Okay.
And so our delta t and our v is equal to delta t is going to be a thousandth of a second. Okay. And our delta phi, that is from our maximum to the minimum. Uh, well, the minimum is zero because, you know, when sine of zero, uh, when theta is equal to zero, sine of zero is zero. Okay. So the minimum flux is going to be zero. The maximum flux happens at 90 degrees. So that's just going to be basically your magnetic field times A times sine of 90 degrees, which is one. The magnetic field I told you was um, uh, 500 milliteslas or 0.5 teslas. And the area now is the area of the loop, but it's a square loop. So it's just length times width. So it's one centimeter by three centimeters or 0 0.01 meters by 0 0.03 meters because we got to work in MKS. And that gives us three times 10 to the minus four uh, meters squared. And putting that into our flux, B, 0.5 teslas, A, 3 times 10 to the minus 4 meters squared, and that gives us a flux of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4 tesla meters squared. So there you go. There are the units of, uh, of um, uh, flux. They're tesla meters squared. And so now uh, that's your maximum. Your minimum is 0, so your delta phi is going to be 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4 um, tesla meters squared. It takes only a thousandth of a second for it to, to make that change in flux. And so if you plug that in there, here's our thousandth of a second down here, 10 to the minus 3. It turns out that you get 0.15 volts. Okay, so the uh, voltage that's going to be induced around this loop will actually be, uh, will actually be uh, 0.15 volts. Okay. Uh, and now the next question is, um, do these uh, units work out? Okay. Namely, if you take a Tesla meter squared and divide it by a second, does that really give you a volt? Because I just said that it gives you a volt and it's MKS, so it should sure give you a volt, but does it actually work out to a volt? And so let's take a look at that. Let's find out. Is a volt really equal to a Tesla meter squared per second? So um, the best way to understand the Tesla is always from Lorentz's law. And remember from Lorentz's law that a Tesla is basically a Newton per amp meter. Okay. Uh, just to remind you, if you have one meter of wire carrying one amp, in a one tesla field perpendicular that's going to give you one newton of force okay so if we put that in there for our tesla so we have a newton per amp meter and we multiply uh, everything out we get to this form right here okay but a newton meter that's a joule okay because you know, that's work you know if you do a newton if you have a newton of force and you push something one meter that's basically one joule of work so one newton meter is a joule and an amp remember what an amp is it's a measure of current it's one coulomb traveling past you every second so one amp is a coulomb per second so if you put that in here basically you're going to get that uh, 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 an amp times a second is just a coulomb and so newton meter on top gives you a joule an amp second gives you a coulomb a joule per coulomb that's exactly what a volt is, okay? These units are getting pretty tricky, okay? And there's like a, a, a bunch of different ways in which you can drive them and show them that they work out. I'm not going to do all of them, but yeah, they do work out, okay? So there you go. That's why I said amazing because it's not something that you would have, you know, seen intuitively uh, from the beginning, okay? So, um, so there you go. Uh, this is uh, basically Faraday's law. All right. And uh, now we can actually describe two very important uh, devices that. Two, sorry, uh, something crashed there. Uh, two very important devices uh, in uh, um, our modern world. And uh, they are the electric motor and the electric generator. OK, so actually Ampere's law is the um, uh, uh, the law which governs how an electric motor works. And Faraday's law is kind of the opposite of Ampere's law. It's how an electric generator works. So let's just take a look at those two uh, devices just qualitatively. And so here, uh, an electric motor, how does it work? Well, basically, we have a loop of wire here like that. And we don't just apply the current in one direction. We actually apply a current in alternating 
uh, an alternating current. So one moment the current is traveling one way and then we turn it around and we have it uh, travel in the other direction. Of course, by Ampere's law, this means that you're going to get a magnetic field, but the magnetic field itself is going to alternate in direction. So that's why I have this magnetic field. And it looks kind of funny there because, you know, it's pointing this way and then it's also pointing the other way. And you go, well, which one is it? Well, it depends on which way the current is going. And I also have the current uh, bouncing back and forth. So as the current bounces back and forth, one minute it's going one way and then the next minute it's going the other way. The B field is going to bounce back and forth, back and forth. Okay, so one minute the B field is one way and the next minute the B field is the other way. Well, let's put a magnet in that the vicinity of that B field. Okay, and so one minute the magnet is going to be want to, want to orient itself one way. The next minute it's going to want to orient itself the other way. In other words, it's going to want to flip. Well, you know, you get the mechanism right to make sure that it doesn't just flip back and forth, that it actually rotates. And what you're going to do is as you keep alternating the current here, you alternate the magnetic field. And as you alternate the magnetic field, you turn the magnet. And there you go. There's an electric motor. OK, so I don't know if you've ever taken apart electric motors. I used to love taking things apart as a kid, uh, which is probably why I wound up in physics. But I took apart electric motors and sure enough you could see these uh, uh, magnets in there and coils of wire and the coils of wire when they have these uh, currents traveling through them they will force the magnets uh, to churn okay uh, usually it's done in some other ways but this is good enough to, to really explain what's uh, going on okay usually they have the magnetic fields um, stationary and they cause the coils to turn but it's still the same idea okay so there you go. This is how an electric motor works. And it's based off of Ampere's law. So how does a generator work? Well, you know what? It's the exact opposite. It's the same diagram. OK, but this time what you do is rather than applying the current, you rotate the magnet. But as the ro magnet rotates, it changes the flux through the coil or through the loop here. And as the flux changes, you get an alternating current. You induce a current. Okay. Well, when the flux is changing one way, the current turns one way, and when the uh, flux is changing in the opposite direction, you get the current going in the other direction. Okay. And so, an electric motor run backwards. That is, instead of you applying a, a, a current to it and it turns something, you turn it. It will induce a current, and it becomes an electric generator. Okay. So the same. Th uh, electric motor and electric generator they're really the same device it just depends on what are you inputting are you inputting a current then you'll get out mechanical energy do you input the mechanical energy that is you rotate the magnet then you get output a current okay so just thought i'd mention those because at this point we can uh, understand the two all right so last uh topic with um uh, uh, magnetism. Uh, Faraday's law together with Lenz's law, the two really um, aren't, are not separated. I mean, Faraday's law says that the changing flux creates a, a potential and the Lenz's law just says uh, what direction that uh, potential is in. Okay. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, the two together actually make it possible to create yet another device known as an inductor. Okay. And that's what we're going to study to the end of this uh, uh, video. Okay, so what is this inductor? An inductor basically is uh, a device which uses a B field to resist the change in the current. And this is sometimes useful in electronics because what you're going to do is if you get a current going, you don't want the current to abruptly shut off. Okay, and to prevent a current from just shutting off uh, abruptly, you actually use this inductor which has this B field which keeps the trying to push the current. Remember Lenz's law, what it says if the B field tries to change. It actually induces a current which tries to oppose that change in the B field. So the B field kind of keeps the current always going. Okay, it tries to avoid a change in the in the current. Okay, of course, you know if you don't keep giving it energy, then it, then you know it will uh, eventually damp out, and you'll see that with our uh, my uh, RL circuit that I'll study in a, we'll study in just a second. But basically, that's what an inductor is. It's a device which uses a B field to try to resist any kind of changes in the current in a, in a circuit. Okay. And uh, how does this work? Well, here's uh, a little diagram, a little um, current di uh, a circuit diagram of a current. There's no battery here. There's just a current. And this current is traveling through the solenoid. And guess how you make a good inductor? You use a solenoid. So this uh, uh, current is traveling through this inductor. And when the current travels through the inductor, it establishes a B field in there. 
Okay. And what winds up happening is, and now this is an ideal situation. If there's no resistance in the wire, the B field makes sure that the current just keeps going. OK, so of course, you got to get the current going to start with. OK, if you just hook up a, a solenoid, you know, and you just tie the, the two ends of the solenoid together, there's not going to be a current. You got to get the current going. But once the current is going, if you close the circuit this way, the B field here will make sure that that current keeps going and it doesn't stop. Again, ideally, no resistance. If there's a resistance, it will eventually damp out. And we'll look at that in a second. But if there's no resistance, the B field here will keep the current going. And you go, why? Why does that happen? Well, imagine that the the current tries to slow down. If the current tries to slow down, then that changes the B field. The B field tries to decrease. But if the B field decreases, a changing B field induces a current. And it'll induce a current which counteracts the attempt of the current to, to decrease. Okay, So the, the current tries to decrease, but that causes a change in the B field, which tries to increase the current back to where it was. And so it kind of keeps itself at an equilibrium. Okay, That's roughly how an inductor works. Okay, And uh, so um, uh, let's take a look at uh, how we define the inductance of an inductor. OK, so uh, basically um, there is a, um, a current traveling. And if the current tries to change, OK, uh, then it actually creates a voltage inside of the wire. All right. And degree to which the changing current actually creates a voltage, a potential, uh, that's called the inductance. OK, that's actually given a measure. OK, now why you want to define it this way, you'll see in just a second. But uh, let's just see if we can understand the physics here. Uh, you know, we got this current going. All right. And the current tries to change over time, it tries to make a change over time. And what happens is, is because of the B field, OK, it, it creates a current to counteract it so that the current can't change. And so a changing current actually leads to some potential, which then and, and you know that a potential will actually create a, a current. OK, now the degree to which the changing current tries to create a potential in that circuit that I just drew, the degree to which that happens, that's known as the inductance, and it's given the symbol uh, L. OK, now, uh, you know, this might be a little bit mysterious to you. Let's see what the relationship is between this and Faraday's law, because after all, it's Faraday's law, which is responsible for, you know, pushing that current back up when it tries to decrease. OK, again, the current tries to decrease that tries to change the magnetic field. The changing magnetic field means that there's a changing flux and a changing flux means that there's a potential which boosts the, the current back up. OK, so uh, let's start off with um, uh, Faraday's law and let's see if we can actually get it into this form. OK, so that we can identify the inductance for a particular uh, device and you can almost guess the device. It's a solenoid. All right. And so um, if we take the magnetic flux for a solenoid, remember I gave you that formula earlier, it's B times not just the cross-sectional area, but the cross-sectional area times the number of loops, because each loop adds its own contribution to the flux, times the sine of A, okay, or sorry, sine of theta, uh, and the orientation of the loops. Let's assume that the, uh, the, the loops are perpendicular to the magnetic field, which is what you get in a solenoid anyhow. OK, uh, I mean, you can make the solenoid kind of a weird shape, but, you know, in a proper solenoid where the loops are like this, OK, they're coiled like that, like I, I drew above, the magnetic field is perpendicular to the to the area that each loop creates. OK, so sine, so theta here is 90 degrees and sine of theta is one. And so you can write that as um, just B times Na. Now, the other thing is, is we're talking about a solenoid and there's a relationship because of Ampere's law of the magnetic field in the solenoid due to the current that's applied. OK, and so that was the one of the formulas I gave above from Ampere's law. The magnetic field is basically mu naught times n over L, the density of the windings multiplied by the current. OK, and we can plug that back into here and get the flux for a solenoid. OK, and, and uh, plug that back into here and then plug that into here. And that's what we have right here. OK, now this doesn't look like the formula we had above, but it is. It's delta the flux. Here is the flux. OK, that's delta the flux divided by delta T. I just pulled the delta T out front so that it's a little easier to see. And then this is delta and the, everything in the square brackets here is the flux. Now, what's going into that flux? Well, B is going into the flux and here is B. OK, for the solenoid mu naught N over L times I 
that's your B for the solenoid. And then it's multiplied by A, but A enhanced N times. So there's your NA like that. And you can just rearrange this and it looks like this. Okay. And now you'll notice that and the number of windings in the solenoid that doesn't change you know you're not you're going to you're not going to go into the circuit and unwind it so n remains fixed the area of the solenoid we're going to leave that alone we're not going to take the solenoid and squish it or anything like that okay so the cross-sectional area of the solenoid will stay the same the length of the solenoid will stay the same so everything here stays the same and mu naught that's just the constant I is the only thing that can change okay so we can pull all of these constants out front and you just have I and so now you can write Faraday's law for a solenoid as this quantity out front times delta I over delta T. OK, so once again, you know, in that diagram that I had earlier, let me just go back to this diagram here. I, I agree this is a little bit subtle, so it's worth, you know, thinking about this in this diagram. There's this solenoid and this solenoid has a current going through it. OK. Now, if the current were to try to change, that would be like a delta I over some time delta T, okay? That would cause a change in B, and the change in B would then counteract and cause a, 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 a corresponding change in I to try to restore the original I so that I stays at equilibrium. You know what it's like? It's like, um, you know, like a pendulum, you know, and it's down here. If you displace the pendulum to one side, well, then it's going to swing back, okay? So it, it, so the B field always wants to restore the uh, the current back to I. If you try to, def, you know, increase it a little bit, it'll the B field will, will decrease it back to its original value. Or if you try to decrease I, then it'll increase it back to the original value. Of course, when you increase I, in that moment when you increase I, there's a uh, the B field is creating this potential that uh, this V, which then creates a current to counteract and bring I back. OK, and that's what this equation is all about. All right. Down here. If there's a change in I over some time, then it's going to create some change in V for the solenoid. We actually have the relationship between the rate at which I changes and the induced V. And it's this quantity here. Okay. Now, if you look at this equation here and you look at the definition of what inductance is, so this here, uh, think of this as the definition. I know I don't have L isolated on the one side, but this equation here tells you what you mean by L. L, the inductance, is the constant of proportionality between the rate at which I changes and the voltage that it induces. OK, so uh, if you have a very weak inductor, then you're going to need a very rapid and big change in I over time to get very little V. That's a poor inductor. A very good inductor will give you a lot of voltage for just a very little change in I over time. OK, so that's the way to think about uh, an inductor. It's like how much voltage do you get for a given rate of change in I? OK, and for the solenoid. There it is. It's this quantity right there. OK, because here's your change in I over time. That's the rate at which I will change over time. And there's the voltage that's induced and the quantity out in front is the inductance. So da -da, there is the formula for the inductance of a solenoid. OK, how does it go? Well, the more windings there are, the more inductance there is. The bigger the cross sectional area, the more B field you have in there because the bigger the area, the more uh, B field you're capturing, the bigger the inductance. And the the, the shorter the um, the solenoid, in other words, the more dense the, the windings are, the, the bigger the inductance. And of course, mu naught is just that permeability of free, free space. OK, uh, there it is. Uh, and we're going to use this uh, to solve a problem in just a second. But uh, remember, with a solenoid, uh, you can actually put a ferromagnet in the middle, put a ferromagnetic core in it. And if you put a ferromagnetic core in it, you actually change that mu naught, you enhance the mu naught. And so uh, if there's a ferromagnetic material inside the solenoid, you replace the mu naught with mu r times mu naught, where this mu r is uh, just known as the relative uh, permeability of the ferromagnetic material. We saw a problem like that before. OK, and we're actually going to use the same uh, ferrite material with a mu r of 2300. It's basically the enhancement of the permeability because of the presence of the uh, ferromagnetic material. Okay, uh, just one comment. 
about this formula, you'll notice this, this n squared there. And you go, why is it n squared? And uh, the reason is, is that uh, uh, oftentimes inductance is often is called self-inductance. And you go, why is it called self-inductance? And so you have to think about it this way. Each loop interacts with every other loop. Okay, so it's like the, the loops are like influencing one another. How? Well, each loop, because it carries a current, creates a B field. Okay, so the loops are creating the B field. But at the same time, the B fields created by those loops, they're going to induce a current in the other loops if the B field changes. Okay, so it's every loop is interacting with every other loop. One loop will create a B field, which another loop will feel if that B field changes. OK, and that's why it comes in as, a, as an n squared. OK, so, you know, if you have um, 10 loops and each loop is interacting with 10 loops, that's 10 times 10 loops. And there you go. There's your, your n squared. OK, well, let's use that formula to calculate the inductance for uh, a solenoid. And so here we have that mu r is equal to 2300 for nickel zinc ferrite. This is the same material, uh, ferromagnetic material that we discussed uh, earlier when we made an electromagnet uh, out of a out of a solenoid. Okay, and what is L for the solenoid made with uh, 100 windings of wire, 5 centimeters long, with a diameter of uh, 1 centimeter filled with uh, uh, nickel zinc ferrite. Okay, so uh, let's go through it. Uh, well, I tell you that there are 1,000 windings, so capital N, the number of windings is 1,000. Okay, I tell you that the length of the solenoid is uh, 5 centimeters long, so L is 5 centimeters, so 0.05 meters okay and the solenoid uh i mean you can make square solenoids that is they're you know they're still wrapped but they're you know like every time you make a loop you actually make a square loop like that okay so you, you could do that but in this case we have round loops okay and i'm telling you that the diameter of the solenoid that is from one end to the other end is one centimeter so that means that it's got a radius of half a centimeter Okay, so the diameter of the solenoid is one centimeter, and so the radius is half a centimeter or 0.5 centimeters, and you got to convert that to um, to MKS, so it's 0 0.005 meters. Okay, so there's the radius of the solenoid, and we need the cross-sectional area, so the cross-sectional area is pi r squared. Remember when we were working with like um, the continuity equation with fluids, and we had like you know round pipes, the cross-sectional area was pi r squared. Is the same idea there? Okay, and so if we plug in the numbers to get the area first, that's pi, and r is 0 0.005 squared, and so that gives us a cross-sectional area of 7.85 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared. And now we're ready to plug all our numbers into the uh, uh, equation for the uh, inductance of a solenoid. It's going to equal mu r times mu naught. It's not just mu naught because there's the, because of the presence of the ferromagnetic material, it's mu r times mu naught, n squared a over l. Okay, so there's the mu r, the relative permeability, that's that 2300 for nickel zinc ferrite. Uh, there's mu naught, okay, 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6 tesla meters per amp times, there's our n squared, 1000 squared, multiplied by the cross sectional area, which we just calculated, 7.85 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared, divided by the length, which was 5 centimeters or 0 0.05 meters. Okay, and it works out to 4.55 tesla meters squared per amp. And you go, what the heck is a tesla meter squared per amp? Well, we could live with that unit. It's a measure of inductance. But uh, because one of the physicists that worked on this was called Henry, we call it a Henry. Okay. And actually, one Henry is pretty big. It's quite a lot of inductance. But that ferromagnetic material, uh, that's really what's doing a lot of the enhancing here. Okay. And so uh, the inductance of that particular uh, solenoid is uh, 4.55 Henrys. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this Henry, uh, the units in, in uh, electromagnetism, they go wild, okay? And we're going to have to see that, um, and we're going to work with Henry's a little bit. So it's good to see how uh, Henry relates to some of the other units. And so um, another way to understand a Henry is uh, to uh, express it as um, a uh, uh, volt second per amp. And you go, well, how does that work out? Uh, well, um, if you go back to the equation that defined inductance, uh, 
uh, we had V is equal to L delta I over delta T. If you just do a, a unit analysis on this, uh, potential is measured in volts, so there's your volt, okay? Uh, delta T is measured in time, so there's your second. Uh, I is measured in amps, so there's your amp. And if you just isolate the L on one side here, you're going to get that an L, is uh, which a Henry, is going to be a volt second per amp, okay? So this is yet another way to think of a Henry. So one way to think of a Henry is... Uh, a Tesla meter squared per amp, and that came out from our uh, calculation of the uh, inductance of a solenoid, and that's the same as a volt second per amp. And the other thing, the other way you'll see this, in, and this is probably the most important way to see it, is uh, remember that an, uh, an ohm, which is a measure of resistance, one ohm is a volt per amp, and so we have a volt here and we have an amp there, so a volt divided by an amp is an ohm, so the, the another way to think of a Henry is an, as an ohm second. Okay, so the one Henry is equal to the same as one ohm second. All right, and uh, this is actually not that bad. I mean, a lot of people usually think of Henry's as ohm seconds, and the reason is that an inductor is a little bit like a resistor. Okay, not quite. I mean, there there's some significant dif differences, but at least in one respect, you can think of an inductor as a resistor, because what does a resistor do? Well, a resistor impedes current. Okay, so you remember that when you know one of the first uh, circuits I drew was a battery and a resistor, and uh, the bigger the resistor was, the the less current you were going to get. Okay, that was Ohm's law. Okay, why? Because the resistor resisted current. Well, an inductor doesn't quite resist current. It, it's um, what it does is it resists changes in current. Okay, and so it's a little bit like a resistor because it'll resist the change in the current. But if there's a current there, it says, okay, I'm happy with that current. But if you try to increase that current or you try to decrease that current, it undergoes that dynamic that I mentioned earlier and it, it resists that change. And so that's why it's not surprising that it's it, there's the omen there, but it's a change over time. And that's why there's a second in there. Okay, so a Henry is an ohm second. All right. All right, so um, there's a lot of properties to inductors, but I, you know, we're not going to go off and you know do a full electronics course, uh, and I'm just going to mention them uh, to you. Uh, they're pretty easy to to remember, so there's not very deep. Uh, but really, the, um, the the circuit that I want to end this with is uh, an LC circuit. But uh, let's just uh, mention a few other properties of uh, inductors. Uh, the first thing is, uh, you know, like when we had resistors and capacitors, inductors yet another uh, electronic device. Well, remember resistors, uh, resistors in parallel and resistors in series. Resistors in series, they add. Inductors do too. Okay, so if you have two inductors in series, like one inductor right after another, the equivalent inductance is just the sum of the two inductors, uh, inductances. Okay, so they're just like resistors, and the same thing when they're in parallel. Okay, so when you have uh, two inductors in parallel, their equivalent is the sum of the reciprocals. So one over the L equivalent is equal to one over L one plus one over L two. Okay, so the way to remember this is uh, just remember that. Uh, uh, for series in parallel, inductors and resistors work exactly the same way, okay? Uh, that is series add, uh, parallel reciprocals add, okay? Uh, we had the um, capacitors, we had an RC circuit. Uh, well, you know what? You can have RL circuits too, okay? Now, if you remember the RC circuit, and that was in the previous video, in the RC circuit, you charged up the capacitor, and then you allow the capacitor to discharge through a resistor. If there was no resistance there, if the and the wire were like a perfect wire, the capacitor would instantly discharge. I mean, all the electrons on the one side would just flop over to the other side, and that's it. But if there's a resistor, what does the resistor do? It limits the current, so it just allows a slow trickle of current to come across, and then the resistor, uh, sorry, the capacitor takes some time to discharge through the resistor. Okay. Well, it's the same thing with an uh, an RL circuit. So if you go back up here when I first introduced this circuit all the way up here I said this was an ideal circuit and I said to you the current will never speed up or slow down here the current will stay constant in this okay uh, that's because the B field will cause it to do that but also you have to assume that there's no energy being lost in the wires okay now that doesn't happen in reality because every wire has a little bit of resistance but if the wires had no resistance the current would just travel through this 
uh, wire all the time and the current would never increase or decrease because if it tried to increase the B field would bring it back okay or another way to think about it is any fluctuations of the uh, current which always occur because of whatever uh, the B field would always restore restore it back uh, to uh, uh, to its equilibrium value okay but in reality there's always a little bit of resistance in the wire and so what happens when you have an RL circuit and so what's an RL circuit well here it is this looks a lot like the RC circuit only instead of a C there I have an L there okay and you'll notice that the switch can be in one of two positions if I put the switch in position number one the battery is going to start a current going okay never mind this little leg here okay because if the switch is in position one then that little leg there is, is irrelevant and you just get a current traveling through the uh the resistor that gets the current going okay and that current won't go off to infinity because why because there's a resistor there that's going to limit it okay uh and then when you switch the um the switch to uh, to position number two what's going to happen well the um the current that's going through there uh you'd think well there's no battery the current will just stop no because the b field in here tries to keep the current going it tries to keep the current going but there's energy being lost in the resistor and so the current will exponentially decay. So just like the RC circuit where it was the charge in the capacitor which charges up and then discharges, Q goes to a maximum and then it decays away. Here it's not a charge, it's actually the current. So when the switch is in position one, the current builds up. It doesn't build up right away. It can't jump right away because what does the inductor do? It resists a change in the current. So even when the current starts to build up, if there's no current and the current starts to build up, the inductor goes, nah, I really don't like that. Eventually it will because there's you know energy in the battery and it's going to push that current through. But it doesn't allow an immediate jump in the current. If that inductor weren't there and you close that switch, the current would immediately jump to its maximum value. OK, but because there's an inductor there, the current has to exponentially approach its maximum value. Then <clears throat> when you close the switch, if you close the switch and there were no inductor there, the current would immediately stop. But because there's an inductor there and an inductor re uh, resists a change in the current, the inductor is going to try to keep that current going, just like you saw above. But there's the resistor there, which will eventually slow it down, resist this current, and it'll eventually slow it down, slow it down, and it'll, and it'll go to zero. So I'm not going to do any derivation. I'll just give you the formulas because here they are. They look just like the formulas for a charging uh, capacitor charging up or capacitor discharging. This is the situation where the... Uh, the switch is in position one. In position one, you start with no current and the current builds up to a maximum, okay? The maximum current that is achieved is exactly what comes out of Ohm's law. The maximum current is going to, just going to be V divided by R. That's just Ohm's law, okay? But you don't achieve that maximum current right away. You start at zero current and you build up over time, okay? Because the inductor won't allow an instant change. And so, your equation looks like this, okay? So this equation, if you compare it to the equation for a capacitor charging up in the RC circuit, you'll see that it looks the same, except that in there we had Qs and here we have Is. So for the RC circuit, you're looking at charges building up. For the RL circuit, you're looking at uh, uh, currents building up, okay? And the current builds up. The other thing that's different, of course, is that the... Um, the time constant tau, I mean, there's no C here, so the time constant is different. The time constant in this case is equal to L divided by R, okay? So there you go, there's the, the time constant for, for that. I'll show you that it actually has the right units in a second. Now, what if you put the switch in position two? Well, in position two, this is the equivalent of the discharging, okay? So now the inductor is trying to push that current through the resistor, but the resistor slows it down, slows it down, slows down the current by dissipating away the energy as joule heating. And so you'll have an exponential decay, and there's your exponential decay. Okay, I didn't even draw the graph, but it looks just like the graph that you saw for uh, an RC circuit where it decays down to zero from starts off at some i naught and then decays down to zero at, at very long times uh the the it, it's useful to look at the units of tau okay the units of tau have to be seconds because you got to have seconds over seconds here and for the rc circuit you would see that tau worked out to be seconds let's see that it works out to be seconds here so here 
the units of tau have to be the units of inductance divided by the units of resistance. And remember, I said probably the best way to think of a Henry is as an ohm second. So you have ohm seconds on top divided by ohms. The ohms cancel out and you're left with seconds and that's what you expected. Okay, so let's do a quick problem with this and then we'll, we'll get to our last circuit, which is the uh, uh, probably the most interesting circuit. It's the, uh, 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 the LC circuit. Okay, so um, we have a 50 millihenry uh, inductor. That's a typical size, you know, uh, millihenrys, uh, micro henrys. Okay, a henry, one henry is quite a bit of inductance. Okay, you can make them, but that's a lot of inductance. Okay, so a uh, 50 millihenry inductor is placed in series with a 50 kilo ohm resistor. Okay, and again, 50 kilo ohms, that's a typical resistor too, and a, uh, and a 10 volt battery. So we have all three in series, and th this is equivalent to the switch being in position one. And so what is the maximum current through the circuit? That's question number one. And how long does it take from when the switch is closed until it reaches, to until the current reaches, I current, reaches 99% of its maximum? Okay, so basically, what are we looking at here? We're looking at this circuit here. But we're looking at this circuit with S in position one. Okay, when S is in position one, we have three devices: the battery, the resistor, and the um, inductor, all in series. All in series. Okay, so here we have a 50 millihenry inductor in series with a 50 kilo ohm resistor and a 10 ohm battery, what is the maximum current? Well, the maximum current, it's like the inductor isn't even there, okay? Once the B field has been built up and the current has reached its maximum, the inductor is happy. It says, well, there's a current going through me and it's not, it's not increasing, it's not decreasing. And as long as the current stays the same, the inductor says fine. Okay. Remember, it's the changing current which leads to the changing magnetic field, which leads to the counter current that tries to counteract the changing current. That's what's going on. Okay, and so it's just Ohm's law. Okay, uh, yeah, there's an inductor there, but it's you know the maximum is just Ohm's law. It's V over R, and so you have 10 volts divided by uh, 50 kilo ohms. Kilo is 10 to the three. Okay, and so that turns out to be 0.2 times 10 to the minus three amps, or 0.2 milliamps, okay, or 200 microamps if you want to write it that way, okay, but 0.2 milliamps is a small, a small current, okay, a small current. Now, the next part says, uh, you know what, we want to know how long from when I switch the, uh, close the switch, okay, and start the current going, so the current is at zero, I close the switch and the current starts to wind up until I reach 99% of the maximum current, okay. Well, for this one, we want to use uh, 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 this equation right here. This equation right here, okay? We want to use that equation, all right? And the ratio of I over I naught, I didn't give you I, and I didn't, I mean, you could use this for your I naught, but I, I didn't give you I, I just said that the ratio I to I naught is 99%. In other words, it's reached, I has reached 99% of the maximum. 0.99 okay so if you plug that into the equation above you get that 0.99 is equal to 1 minus e to the minus t over tau okay then rearranging this because we want to solve for t okay we do know tau I just haven't plugged in the numbers yet but we want to solve for t so like isolate the exponential here e to the minus t over tau is going to equal 1 minus 0.99 that's just a rearrangement of the previous equation which is equal to 0 0.01 okay and now you say, well, what do I do with this? Well, you remember what we did with decibels? And you remember what we did with, with the same equation, but with the, uh, the RC circuit? We had to take the natural log of both sides. So if we take the natural log of both sides, that's LN on your calculator. Take the natural log of both sides. This, taking the natural log of E to the minus T over tau, just strips out the minus T over tau. They're like that. Okay. And the natural log of 0 0.01, well, you can do that on your calculator. It turns out to be negative 4.61 so you get that minus t over tau is negative 4.61 now the negatives drop out and that basically tells you that the time you have to wait is 4.61 taus and you say but do i know tau and you do because i told you what l is and i told you what r is and tau is equal to l over r so l is 50 uh, millihenries so that's 50 times 10 to the minus 3 henries 
R is uh, 50 kilo ohms, so that's 50 times 10 to the 3 ohms. And if you divide this out, that's 1 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. 10 to the minus 6 is a microsecond. So the time constant here is really short. It's only one microsecond. Okay, so this is very fast. And so the current, it doesn't, it's not instant. It's fast, but it's not instant. It would take 4.61 milliseconds to build up from 0 to 99% of its maximum value. Okay, 99% of its maximum value. Uh, you can measure this on an oscilloscope. Okay, obviously a millisecond is way too short for human things. So if you if you hooked up something else, like, I don't know, an LED or something like that to try to see this, I mean, you wouldn't. It, it would, to the human eye, it would just seem instant. But to an oscilloscope, yeah, you, you would you'd be able to see that this is actually taking uh, 0 0.461 milliseconds. You just set the, the oscilloscope to trigger on 99% um, on of what you expect I not to be, and, and you'll get the, the trace. And from the trace, you'd be able to see that it took 0 0.461 milliseconds to, to build up. Okay, last circuit uh, that we're going to study is an LC circuit. Okay, so the previous one was an LR circuit. So we had a resistor and an inductor together. And you know what the resistor is going to do. It's just going to bleed away the, the current. So the inductor is trying to keep this current going. The inductor is trying to keep the current going, but the resistor bleeds it away and you get the exponential decay. Okay, but what happens if you put an L and a C uh, circuit, uh, uh, an L and a C together in series in a circuit? Okay, and you might even ask the question, what happens if you put L, C and R together? OK, well, we're not going to study the LCR, um, but the LC gives you, believe it or not, an oscillator. OK, it'll actually oscillate with a certain frequency. We'll, I'll, I'll, I won't derive that for the 112. I will for the 102, but in another in another video. OK, I'm actually going to do some calculus to show you that that's true. But the, the LC actually turns out to be like a simple harmonic oscillator, which is amazing. OK, the LCR turns out to be a damped harmonic oscillator. OK, so, you know, in the lab uh, that we did where we had the damped harmonic oscillator, the LCR circuit actually acts like a damped harmonic oscillator, whereas the LC by itself acts just like a, a harmonic oscillator. So, uh, like I said, I'll derive that for the uh, the 102. For, but for both of you, you know, like, how do we understand this? How can we understand that this LC circuit is actually going to act like an oscillator? So here it is. Here's my LC circuit. Here's my inductor L, and here's my capacitor. Okay, and we got to start this thing going. Okay, so you know, like a pendulum will bob back and forth. But if the pendulum is just sitting there, it's not bobbing back and forth. Someone's got to come by and pull it to the side and let go and oscillates like that. Okay, and so uh, you got to start this whole thing going by you know either charging up the capacitor or getting a current going through the inductor, one or the other. But, you know, you got to start it going. And I said, you know what, like, uh, uh, you know, like th this uh, this little V here, uh, I guess it should have been a battery, not a voltmeter, but you know, that little V there, uh, I'm just saying, you know what, I'm just going to charge up my, my, uh, my capacitor, okay? So you can imagine the, taking the capacitor out of the circuit, applying a voltage, charging it up, and then putting it back into the... Uh, into the circuit. Okay, so we start off by charging out the capacitor. So here we go. Here's step number one. Okay, and you have this uh, capacitor here, and uh, one part of it has a positive charge, one part has a negative charge. And of course, what what is it like to do? It wants the the current uh, using the conventional current, which goes from positive to negative. The current wants to flow from the positive to the negative right there, like that. Okay, and it actually can because it sees a wire there and goes, "Hey, I've got this closed circuit. I can flow through there." Okay. Now, if this inductor weren't there, this were just a straight wire, and these were perfect wires with no resistance, the current would go. Let's just all go at once. We'll just we'll do it all at once, and bloop, the capacitor would instantly discharge. Okay. But there's this inductor there, and remember what an inductor does. It resists a change in current. And so the capacitor first has to do some work to get the current going, but it does. As the capacitor discharges, a current starts to uh, build up. Whoa, it's going to kick me out. No, I don't want to get kicked out. Cancel. OK. Uh oh, sorry, guys. One sec. There we go. OK. Uh, I guess our uh, the Moodle session uh, uh, ended and it's at a 
kick me out but uh, we're almost done anyhow so uh you know as the capacitor discharges here it uh, does so by creating a current but the current as it passes through the inductor starts to build up a, a magnetic field so the capacitor in order to get that current going discharges 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 and eventually it's totally discharged but in doing that it got a current going and that current when it was going through the inductor which tried to resist it, but, you know, got pushed through there, built up a magnetic field, built up a magnetic field, built up a magnetic field. And now we're in the situation where we have a current and it's being pushed through the inductor by the magnetic field. The magnetic field in there said, and the inductor says, no, I don't want this current to slow down. I don't want this current to stop. Keep it going. And so the current keeps going. And you know what's going to happen? Yeah, the capacitor is discharged, but not for very long because what happens is the... Uh, as the magnetic field collapses, the inductor keeps pushing that current, pushing that current. And now the capacitor starts to build up with a positive charge on this side and a negative charge on that side. Well, that continues until the inductor just has no more energy left. The magnetic field is totally collapsed. And you're back to the situation where there's no magnetic field in the, uh, in the uh, inductor. And the capacitor is totally charged up. But now what does the capacitor do? The capacitor says, I want to discharge. I want to discharge by sending my current back the other way. And so if you're, you want the analogy to the pendulum, you know, we swung from one side here to the other side, and now we're going to swing back, okay? So originally, we had, you know, the top plate positively charged. But now we've swung around to the other side and now the bottom plate is positively charged. And these positives say, I want to go to the other side. Of course, they do that through the inductor. The inductor builds up a magnetic field and there's a current going and it keeps pushing them through until the we're back to step one. And this just keeps repeating. OK, so you're going between the inductor having no B field and the capacitor being charged up. The capacitor discharges, creates a current through the through the inductor, and now there is a built-up B field. The built-up B field keeps the current going, and that you know charges up the capacitor, and they go back and forth, back and forth like that. They go back and forth with a certain frequency. Okay, so um, you know I'm not going to prove it here, but here it is. Here is the frequency at which the oscillation occurs. Now uh, this I just put there because that's what's going to come out of my derivation for physics 102. But for physics uh, 102 and 111, this is the linear frequency, and that's what you would measure in the lab. Okay. So if you build this LC circuit, what you would discover is that it oscillates. Okay. And you could hook it up to an oscilloscope, and you would see that the voltage goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down like that. It'll actually oscillate, and it oscillates with a frequency f which is equal to 1 over 2 pi, the square root of L times C. Okay, so there's the linear frequency of uh, the oscillating um, uh, LC circuit. All right, now, <clears throat> um, let's do a, um, an example with this. Okay, uh, so the first thing is, uh, like, where would you use this oscillating circuit? So, uh, this is basically like a resonance. Now we didn't get to do the the, the vibrating string lap in the la in the physical lap, but uh, there when you had the sonometer, you had uh, that pickup mic which was receiving it, but you also had this driver, and the driver you could tune the frequency on the driver, and when the driver had a frequency which matched the frequency of the string, the string would start to vibrate at that frequency, and those frequencies were discretized. Okay. That's exactly what's happening. What happened here? If you build this LC circuit and you don't charge up the the uh, the capacitor and you don't uh, you know put a current through the um, through the inductor, you just leave them alone. It, you say it's going to sit there. Well, not quite. If you attach an antenna to anywhere on the circuit, radio waves are going to come by, and these radio waves are going to cause the electrons to jostle back and forth. And if these electrons jostle at the same frequency at which the LC circuit oscillates, you're going to have a buildup of the oscillation inside the circuit. You're going to get a resonance, and that's what a radio is. An LC circuit is the simplest possible radio. Uh, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, you can actually look up how to build uh, crystal radios, okay? Uh, they're basically LC circuits, okay? So that's my question here. Uh, we want to build a radio to listen into an FM, to listen to FM radio, okay? And in particular, we want to listen to 94.5 megahertz, 
Okay, so that's what we want to tune into. Um, what inductor size inductor do we need if our capacitor is 47 picofarads? Okay, now pico is very small, but you you do need a small capacitor for this one. Okay, and so uh, you know the question is uh, basically you know we're going to use this equation here. We're going to use this equation here. Okay, uh, and you know the frequency. I told you it's uh, 94.5 megahertz, and I tell you the capacitor, and we want to solve for L. Okay, we want to solve for L. Uh, so uh, if we take that equation and we square it, we get that f squared is equal to 1 over 4 pi squared L over C. That's to get rid of that square root. And then just rearrange it to isolate L on the one side. So basically divide both sides by f squared, multiply both sides by L, and you get this equation here. All right. And now we're ready to plug in, but we just have to be careful. You haven't seen pico before. Okay. Uh, you've seen micro. And that's 10 to the minus 6. That's a million. You've seen nano, which is 10 to the minus 9. Pico is 10 to the minus 12. Yeah, there are really tiny uh, capacitors that are down in the 10 to the minus 12 farads. And these are basically picofarad uh, capacitors. So this capacitor is 47 picofarads. And pico there, you're going to replace with 10 to the minus 12. Okay, 10 to the minus 12. And so substituting in the numbers in MKS, uh, there's 4, uh, pi squared, 3.14 squared. F, the frequency is 94.5 mega, and mega is 10 to the 6, squared. Okay, And the capacitor is 47, pico is 10 to the minus 12. Okay, So if you work this out, this works out to 6 times 10 to the minus 8 henrys, or... Uh, if you want to, you know, convert it to nano Henry's, you know, uh, just move the decimal over one to the left here, and that's going to make minus eight minus nine there. So it's 0.6 times 10 to the minus nine Henry's, and 10 to the minus nine, that's a nano. So it's 0.6 nano Henry's. Okay. And so if you take a 47 picofarad uh, capacitor, which you can actually buy, okay, uh, 47 uh, picofarad seems to be one of the standard size. Uh, capacitors and you put it in series with a 0.6 nano uh, Henry uh, inductor uh, you could tune into you would be tuning into 94.5 FM okay that's kind of cool all right so there's how the uh, uh, how you build a crystal radio uh, here's another um, uh, example so a typical size uh, inductor is 50 micro henry's and a typical size capacitor is 50 nanofarads and we build an lc circuit and at what frequency does it also i just wanted to show you like you know uh, what typical size capacity what frequencies you get with typical size capacitors and inductors so you plug in these numbers and i'm just going to skip the details here you wind up with uh 100 kilohertz okay so 100 kilohertz. Uh, that's just below. That's below the um, uh, FM radio. I think FM starts at 550 or 570. I'm not sure which, but you know, it's a, it's it's a basically long wavelength. Okay, um, below the F AM radio. All right. So uh, there you go. Now, <clears throat> last thing we're going to do with LC circuits. Um, a minute ago, I made this analogy between the oscillation of the LC circuit and the oscillation of a string and a sonometer. And is there more to that analogy? And the answer is yes. And it's a rather remarkable thing. So that's why I want to end with this last point. Okay. So it's insightful to see what kind of frequency you get if we build our LC circuit using parallel plate capacitors for our capacitor and a solenoid for our inductor. Okay. Um, you know, like uh, you could build inductors in other ways, solenoid is the more typical way. You can build capacitors in other ways, but parallel plate is the most typical. Okay. So, you know, we, we kind of abstract them, but let's, let's go back to the, actually the, the way we, um, uh, the way we would, uh, the way I showed you could design uh, capacitors and inductors. So if you go back to the capacitor, a capacitor, a parallel plate capacitor has a capacitance C given by this formula here. So what's this formula? A is the area of the two plates and D is the distance between them. Now I had to call this AC because I need to distinguish this from the cross-sectional area of the inductor. So AC is the area of the two plates in the capacitor. They're a distance D apart. I don't have any dielectric in there. Okay, I didn't, I didn't put a dielectric. So all I have here is the permittivity of free space. Okay, and now for our inductor, we're gonna use a solenoid 
Here's the solenoid. And uh, from above, that's going to equal the permeability of free space mu naught and squared the cross-sectional area of the solenoid. So I call that one AL divided by L, which is the length of the solenoid. Okay. And uh, just not to confuse things, I just repeated you know, uh, repeated that here. Okay, so AC is the area of the parallel plates and D is the distance between it. AL is the cross-sectional area of the solenoid and L is the uh, length of the solenoid. Okay, now if we put this, these two here, into the equation for, for the frequency, we substitute them in for C and L, we get the following. Okay, whoops. Okay, there we go. Okay, we get the following. All right. Well, I did it in steps. Sorry, I did it in steps. Uh, so here, here's the equation we're substituting in, into. We're substituting into this equation here for LC. Okay, so I did it in steps so that we don't get confused. So I first took L and C and multiplied them together. Okay, and if I take L and C and multiply them together, I get that epsilon naught times the mu naught. Okay, so the permittivity multiplied by the permeability of free space multiplied by this n squared ACAL over DL. Okay, like that. All right. Now, the next thing is, is that if you take a look at the, the formula, it's like uh, F is equal to 1 over 2 pi square root of LC. So I, I still, you know, not to put this in the denominator, just still keep life easy. I just said, let's multiply by 2 pi times the square root of LC. So take all of this and put that in there. Okay. So then we have the 2 pi and I'm going to factor out the epsilon naught mu naught, but it's under the square root because everything's under the square root. And then we get this term here. Okay. And what is this term here? Well, it's that n squared ACAL over D times L. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to rearrange the terms a bit. And you might say, why are you rearranging them this way? And you'll see in a second. I see that pi there. I'm going to put the pi with this square root over here. I'm going to, so I'm going to basically take the two and the square root of the epsilon naught mu naught. I'm going to put them together in the front here. I'm going to take that pi and I'm going to put it with this one. See the n squared there? That's under a square root, so that just becomes an n out in front. So I've got a pi times an n times the square root of the two a's divided by dl. Okay, and you go, what the heck is this? Well, you know what? It really doesn't matter exactly what that is. Let's just think about what the units are of that thing. Okay, well, the units of the two areas, they're meters squared. And the units of the two lengths, D and L, they're both lengths, they're meters. And so if you go into that uh, square root and you just ask, what are the units of that square root? Well, that one's going to be meter squared, that's meter squared, and that's meters and that's meters. So on top, you're going to have meter squared times meter squared. You get meters to the four, and on the bottom you have meter squared. So meters to the fourth divided by meter squared, that's meter squared. But then you take the square root of that and it just turns out to be meters. So whatever this thing is, it's just some length. And you go, what is this length? Well, I don't know. Uh, but we can call it the characteristic length of the LC circuit. And so I'm just going to define the characteristic length of this LC circuit as that pi, which is, I decided to lump in with this, the n, the number of windings, it was n squared under the square root, but when it came out, it's n, multiplied by this quantity here. Okay. And so now this LC it's just some characteristic length to the LC circuit. And you go, well, what is this characteristic length? It, it's kind of the, the net effect of all the geometrical factors that go into building the LC circuit. Okay, it just, uh, I, I, the way I put it here is that the, this length just encapsulates all of the geom geometrical properties. And so basically, if you just take all of that mess up there and just replace it with LC, that 2 pi, the square root of LC is just equal to 2 times the square root of the epsilon naught mu naught multiplied by that characteristic length of the LC circuit. Okay, And if we put that into this equation here, we get 1 over 2 square root of epsilon naught mu naught times LC. And now, I know this is a little bit long, but you know, we're almost done. And now I'm going to say, look, I'm going to say, let me think of this 1 over the square root of epsilon naught mu naught. Let me, let me think of that as a V like some velocity. Well, if I do that, look at what this becomes. This equation becomes F is equal to V two times that characteristic length. And that, that equation should look familiar because you know what that equation is. That's the equation for the fundamental frequency of a string. And at this point you're going, well, what? Where's the string in the LC circuit? How is this LC circuit at all like a string? Well, it is. 
because the string vibrates at a frequency, a characteristic frequency, it's fundamental frequency, and the LC circuit does as well. Okay, so there's something there's something about that, you know, fact that they're both resonance device uh, resonance systems, that means that there's you know a, a, a homology between them, and here it is. Okay, an isomorphism between them. Okay, and at this point you go well. Okay, that LC, that LLC. Okay, that that characteristic length of the LC circuit. That's kind of like all the geometry of the capacitor and the and the inductor all kind of lumped into one thing. Okay, there it is. But what's this V? Well, the V was equal to this, and let's plug in the numbers here. V is equal to one over the square root of epsilon naught mu naught. So we plug in the numbers for the permittivity and permeability of free space. And the permittivity has units farads per meter. The permeability has units henrys per meter. Okay, let's look at the units first because we want to make sure that we get the right units here. I mean, I called it V, but do we know that this is a velocity? Well, let's see if the units work out. Okay, uh, well, you know, if you have a farad, whoops, let's just do the farad times the henry first. So you have a farad times a henry. A farad measure of capacitance is a coulomb per volt. Okay, and henry is an ohm second. Okay, and remember that an ohm is a volt per amp. That's from uh, uh, from Ohm's law. Uh, ohm is a volt per amp. And so if we put that all in here, so here's the coulomb per volt for the farad, and here's the volt per amp times the second for the uh, Henry. And don't forget that an amp is just a coulomb per second, coulomb flowing by per second. And so we put that in here, okay? And so we have coulomb divided by coulomb per second times the second. The coulombs cancel. The second in the denominator of the denominator comes up to the top and gives you second squared. And so a farad times a Henry is a second squared, but we didn't just have farads and Henrys up here. We had farads per meter and Henry per meter. And so if you take a farad per meter and a Henry per meter and you multiply them together, you get a second squared per meter squared. But that's in the square root of the denominator. So if you put that second squared per meter squared under a square root side and you do one over that, you take the reciprocal, that's going to give you meters per second. It's a velocity. This quantity here, okay, I mean, I anticipated knowing the answer that it's going to be a velocity, but this quantity here, 1 divided by the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught, or epsilon naught times mu naught. So that quantity is a velocity. And you might wonder, what is that velocity? So we know it's going to come out per meter squared. Now, if we work out the numbers, it actually turns out that that velocity is 2.99 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And if you look at it for a second and you recognize it, that's the speed of light. And so you go, what? How in the world is this LC circuit? The LC circuit is basically like a string tied down at both ends, okay? A standing wave, with where the velocity of the wave is the speed of light. And the answer is that, guess what? electromagnetic waves are light or light are magnet electromagnetic waves and so the reason i did what i did was i took the frequency of the lc circuit and i purposely massaged it into what looks like the frequency for a standing wave the fundamental frequency for a standing wave the reason i did that was to identify this v and that v turns out to be the speed of light and that's exactly right Okay, the reason you're getting the speed of light there is because Maxwell, a later physicist, we won't do his stuff because it's, it's too advanced, he discovered that oscillating electric fields give rise to, because of Ampere's law, oscillating B fields. But oscillating B fields, because of Faraday's law, give rise to oscillating electric fields, which give rise to oscillating electric fields, oscillating B fields, oscillating E fields, oscillating B fields. This oscillating, creating an oscillator, creating an oscillator, uh, B, E, B, E, means that you basically have wave behavior, but not just in one thing, but in both E fields and B fields, okay? It turns out that radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays, they're all electromagnetic waves of, of different uh, of different wavelength, okay? And it's even more interesting, okay, I didn't write this down, but, you know, since we're here, uh, look at this again. 
Okay. Do you remember what the velocity was for uh, waves on a string? It was the square root of the tension divided by the linear mass density. So you always had these two competing things. You had the tension, which the greater the tension, the more velocity you got for your waves. But that competed against an inertial property, which was like your linear mass density. And the heavier the string was, the slower the waves because, you know, the harder it was to, to cause to oscillate. OK, so the tension increased the velocity and the, the weight, the, the mass density decreased it. Well, you know what? That square root of t over mu, that's exactly like this, okay? It's kind of like the permittivity and the permeability. They're both like the t and the mu, but now these are, this is the tension and the, the density of free space, okay, empty space. And I know that sounds weird that even empty space has properties, but yeah, empty space has properties, and it has a property with respect to E, and it has a property with respect to, to B, and it's those two properties together that actually set the speed of the waves in that medium. Medium in, in quotes because it's empty, okay? And uh, so that's the amazing thing about uh, electromagnetic waves. So I just wanted to end. There's no problems with this, but I just wanted to end since we did study LC circuits. I did want to end this by showing the relationship between the permittivity of free space, that is the ability of free space to sustain electric fields, the permeability of free space, which is the ability of free space to uh, sustain magnetic fields, and the speed of electromagnetic waves. Okay, there you go. Okay, that's the end of this uh, lecture uh, for Physics 112. This is the end of electricity and magnetism. Uh, for Physics 102, there's going to be a short lecture where I derive some of the um, properties uh, for the circuits, uh, for the uh, RC circuit uh, for the uh, uh, LC circuit and for the uh, 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 LR circuit. Okay, I'm going to actually uh, prove some of the things uh, using a little bit of calculus. Okay, thank you.